It's that energy every single day, that just inbound, driven energy to skate. Like Jake had it, Ronnie has it, you know, Pedro has it. And I grew up as a kid idolizing like the thrasher way of life, the skateboard mentality, which to me is skate and destroy. And Jake was that. He lived and breathed that. And, and this video is for him. Right behind Oracle Park, I'm Schmitty and this is Talking Schmidt. Today on the show, Jeff Rowley. In the history of skateboarding, there has only been 28 Thrasher Magazine Skaters of the Year. And in the year 2000 of our Lord, my next guest received this honor with flying colors. There was no doubters. There was no, hey guys, what about? No, Jeff fucking Rowley. Boom. Rowley is credited with reintroducing the vulcanized skate shoe and he's been a staple to the success of Van Shoes since 1999. He had many covers and video parts. In my opinion, is one of the gnarliest pure skaters of his generation. And as he says here, the Sodi Award didn't make him slow down. Quite the opposite of putting his skating in cruise control, actually. I was just getting to know Jake. Like, just getting to know him as, like, a real person when he called me up and told me I'd won Skate of the Year. So my response was just straight straight up the same as what I was trying to push through the mags is like, okay, you're going to give me the opportunity to freaking hammer it down. I'll go to town for you. I will put it all on the line from here on out. That's what it meant, you know? And I try to hold that. I really do. Like I try to never, ever take the easy route. You guys, I've been uh, doing a lot of internal uh, work here at the Barry Street Studios. Uh, we just laid wallpaper down in the bathroom, put up some shells. You know, we're tightening up the ship, as P. Stone would say. Uh, we're looking for some whack packers. You know, we got some inquiries about my comments about stealing some of Howard Stern's magic and creating our own sort of whack pack, or what McKenney is calling uh, the Schmidt Talkers. Uh, email or DM me for details, but I'm looking for some creative, funny, interesting people to basically call in and be a part of the show from time to time. Uh, Tim and I will be starting to interview through Zoom, and so having Zoom right now is the only requirement. Speaking of Tim, he and I are in negotiations with each other, and uh, we're developing a skateboard deck in his honor. Basically, it's that graphic Jeremy Fish made for him right as he uh, kind of retired himself from skateboarding for a few years. And we're going to put it out. Um, we're close. So look for that in the near future. Speaking of Tim again, shout out. Shout out. We have two episodes of the new hit series, Tim and Eric, which has its own playlist on our YouTube channel youtube.com epically trife plug plug and it would mean the world to mckenny to see them numbers increase so go over and watch it comment ask a question give some input and you know tim will respond within minutes bet in skateboarding world this week <clears throat> did anyone see the tony hawk 540 with the full glass of milk i mean this guy just keeps going with unbelievable incredibility tony hawk big love you know that we had some new names getting awarded to the bottom of boards this week as well griffin gas and niels bennett at girl skateboards and the homie julian davidson baby death wish skateboards big love juju and sadly we lost another brother um Thoughts and prayers go out to the friends and family of Vincent Nava who died in an automobile accident this past week. Super sad. People leaving way too early. Uh, be careful out there, people. We need you all alive. <clears throat> Ending on a little more of an upbeat. If you lost connection to the internet and did not see it, holy fuck, Pedro Delfino lit it up with a high-octane Spitfire part this week. 
which was released the same day as Louis Lopez's Lola part from Cons. God damn, skateboarding's final stretch to Sodi has begun. After all, it is September, kids. Okay, well, I know you're all ready for this interview and pay close attention because during it, we will give details on how you can win a free pair of shoes from Vans and a deck from Free Dome Skateboards. So if your mic is ready, Mr. Rally, lead us on in. This is Jeff Rowley and you're listening to Talking Schmidt. It's cool, like tonight is the night. Here we go again. Just give it the old cars turn, isn't it? All big dogs in. Schmitty. 96 times, Schmitty. Thanks, Schmitty. We on? Schmitty. Talking Schmidt. That's called going to the hospital, bitch. I can <laughs> shit my pants, man. Your Rolodex is fucking deep. It's right. about the one. The one. The one. Who is this guy? Thinks he's tough shit. What's up? We're tastemakers. Come on, Schmitty. What the fuck? Let's hear for Greg Smith. Yeah! All right, podcast world, things are looking really good here. Uh, last week, I had Frankie Hill on the show, and this week, I got 2000 Thrasher Magazine Skater of the Year, Jeff Rowley, kids. I'm fucking pumped on this one. Let's do this. How you doing, Jeff? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Frankie uh, Hill last week. Yeah, yeah, you're following Frankie. Yeah, he was great. I, I was stoked on Frankie Hill. Me and every other kid that wanted to jump off a roof. Oh, man. That's why I told him. Huge inspiration. I mean, Jesus Christ. Oh, mama. Yeah. No, he gets forgotten, too, with that. You know, like, the he does. He gets forgotten, like, with because with, it was a long time ago now, that. And he was so far ahead. He was so far ahead of the NAR, wasn't he? Yeah. Like, it was almost like the he was the first guy who put the, like, rocks on the ground kind of right. deal. Like, like yeah. really stepped and went, what, what would happen if I just stood up on a handrail and it's a hundred foot? What would just happen if I stood up and tried to go down it? And no, I could do it and slide the bar. He was that guy. Yeah. Right? Like, he wanted to push that boundary and freaking hugely inspired by that. I think everybody was. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I talked to Duffy about it and he was just like, dude, he was like the guy, like he put the fire yeah. for sure. Yeah, he did. With like rails and gaps and stuff, and like big when everyone was doing caveman's, yeah, like cave, caveman slides yeah. and caveman fifty fifties and like big board slides. So first, really first starting to do really big board slides, right? Like on on actual handrails, not just like little handrails. Or and uh, yeah, so he was he was definitely the first guy to sort of push the board slide like that. Remember that one that just zipped out halfway? That was Long Beach. Long Beach Convention Center. That's right. Like the 35 stairs. 35 stairs or something, but he tried it. <laughs> what year was it? Did you ask him about that? Uh, what yeah. year? That must have been like uh, 1989? I think it was 89 maybe, yeah. I think it was uh, maybe propaganda video or something. Yeah. He told yeah, the story about it. It was insane. They went back to skate the 30 because he had done it without a camera, but the thing had like uh, workers on it. So they're like, yeah. oh, well, 35, you could probably get that. And for some reason, he had the jump ramp in his car. And he did. He said he tried it a bunch of times, and Powell still has the footage. He's like, they got to release the Because he's like, I was getting close, but he's like, I walked away with no clothes that were reusable. <laughs> well, it's because he probably had sweatpants on, cotton sweatpants. He red said he was ones, eating with shit. With a green t-shirt. Like, <laughs> in my head, it's, you know, one of those military pal t-shirts and some yeah. like, red backbone sweatpants that were probably the same sweatpants that Thrasher makes right now, right? Oh, they're right. pretty much the same deal, right? The same fit. Those things rule. Uh -huh. um, but you got to cut them down, though. Otherwise, they get too hot. You have to cut them down in shorts, and then they rip. Let, can we go back to the very early days for a little bit? I know you've covered probably most things in your life many times, but there's a couple of things I was curious about. I know you were born in Liverpool, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Born in, born in uh, Liverpool, England, about a mile and a half out of the city. Oh. So I grew up kind of just south of the city centre. Liverpool's kind of on the coast, so I'm just on the south side of the city. So okay. very close, to town, not far, far from the centre of the town. And did you grow up like a? Was soccer huge for you? Oh my goodness! I used to sleep with football. 
Ah. Yeah. Yes. My dad managed football teams his whole life. My my uncle was a professional footballer, played for Derby County in England during the 70s. Very, very, very well respected defender. His name is Roy McFarlane. I, I grew up in, in a crazy nut job football family. Um, but um, yeah, so I played, I played Sunday League and I played for the school. And, uh, and so, and the side of town that I grew up on, you know, was that whole Beatles side of town where oh. every street name was in a, Be- a Beatles Abbey song. Abbey Road or whatever. I went to the same school as Lennon. You know, my dad went to the same school as Paul McCartney and that. Wow. And so that whole kind of like, you know, circle of influences kind of, was kind of like, you know, my biggest influence. So everything you see in those Beatles movies, you know, all the buildings in the background. Yeah. That's all Georgian architecture, which is, uh, Outside of London, Liverpool's got more Georgian buildings than anywhere else in the UK. So the Georgian period was all like the big ships, you know, all the when big just massive shipments started to first come from Asia and places like that, they'd come into Liverpool. Liverpool's like historically and culturally extremely diverse. And it has a story, one of, you know, a lot of different communities of people having the real, real strong ties to the area, you know? So like the shipping trade, for example. Okay. You know? you know, so that's where I grew up, you know, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful place. It's, you know, it's, it's like every big city. It's got, it's got rough sides and, and, and good sides to it, but the character of the city and the, the way it looks and the people, I love them. I love it. Like I, 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 uh, I miss it. You know? did, did you have a favorite Beatle? Yeah, musically, I liked John, right? But I, but I, I also thought George Harrison was really talented. Yeah, and then that's it. I'm not a fan. Paul McCartney's incredibly good at melody, but I'm not a fan of him. I don't like his writing. I don't like his singing. But him with Lennon, right? That was the Magic. that was the genius. Yeah. yeah. I also felt like before Lennon's life was taken, before he was shot by some you know, uh, not healthy person, right? Um, I felt like he was going to turn around and you were going to see the side of music or that side of him that you hadn't seen. Because from my understanding, like, he was really spending a lot of time working on his music at that point, and he wasn't really influenced by politics or a lot of other stuff. He, he was shifting back to being focused on music. And uh, so I would have liked to have seen what was coming next. Oh, we all you know, would have. I, I, I reckon it would have changed the Sex Pistols and the whole nine yards of it. Because yeah. Lennon punk as fuck. He was. And, uh, and, he, and he grew up in a rough area and he had a rough life. And he was very creative and talented. That's the way I think. So he was my favorite Beatle. I didn't yeah. like his political ties and the way that he attached too much of, you know, some of that to his music. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. Um, but I love, I like his music and his writing, and some of his like solo shit too. Some of the songs, the writing is exceptional in it, but the melody of it doesn't quite hit the McCartney side, right? Yeah, that's kind of, like. He, but he wrote some really good songs, like you know. Did you ever listen to the John Peel show when you were in Liverpool? When he was in Liverpool? No, not really. Like when I was when I was skate, like I moved, I moved to the US when I was eighteen. Right, and I started skating when I was 13. And I was seriously just, I only wanted to, I only wanted to skate and watch skate videos during the time that like, I, when I really started to get into it. That's all I wanted to do. Uh-huh. And until I was like 16 years old or 15, 16, 17, like that's when I really started to listen to music more like get it for myself. Like I was always around the whole hardcore music scene. So I had all of the Black Flag, Descendants, Dinosaur Jr. Yeah, yeah. That catalog of life. Like I, I heard that growing up. Right. So I knew it all. And like, but I was too little to get into the punk shows that were happening. There was a big punk venue in Liverpool called Planet X. Howard Cook used to get in because they'd smuggle him in the back door. And mm. there's, a photo, there's photos of him at like slap shot shows, just jumping into the crowd. He was probably 12 or something like that, um, you know. But I, I didn't, I wasn't as connected to, like his brother was super into all that kinds of music and the, 
guys who worked in skate shops, Robbie Reeve and all those guys that you can probably know some of them seeing them around and you know, some of them still they're totally skate skated their whole life and still managing skate shops and doing whatnot. I wasn't as focused on music as as, uh, as I was at a later age. I was more focused on learning tricks and watching the latest H Street video or, or, or Powell video or Santa Cruz video to get me right. fired up. Okay. You know? Yeah, I know that uh, when John Peel died, he uh, had that song, uh, You'll Never Walk Alone at his funeral. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. I know that's a big Liverpool. Uh, huh? It's a Jeremy Pacemakers thing, right? Like yeah, thing. like the, they they played at the Liverpool soccer games, right? They played at Liverpool games and the crowd sings. It's kind of a song for the city, uh-huh. really. It's But what it's from is from the swinging 60s. Uh, That's all it is. Liverpool was a huge hub in the swing of the 60s for music, right? And as a music hub, and a lot of like a lot of awesome bands came from that. A right. lot of it, music influence from that, you know, the Beatles and all of those Mersey beat bands. Right. But that's where it's from. Like the it's it's the generations from then that are now people's grandparents or, or parents, right? Have carried it on because it's a song from their youth, and, and it means a lot. For somebody from Liverpool's a rough city, and it's a tough city, you know. And it's uh, it has a pretty high unemployment, teenage pregnancy, and you know, crime rate. I mean, it's got it has its issues like a lot of big cities do, right? And um, and so that's a song for you know if you're from live there to give you hope, right? It's a positive song, right? You know, you will always be so will always be at your side. Right, like that's what it means. Like we're always together, like no matter where we're at. But like so all my tattoos and stuff are from like the Second World War kind of stuff because my my grandmother and my grandparents are from that generation. Uh-huh. Right, and so it's like you can't help but care about your grandparents and what they went through, or be pay attention. Or I paid attention to it, and in fact, to the point where I used to ask my grandmother. I, I had no idea that I would, this was just not the thing to do. Don't ask somebody about the war. Like, don't ask them somebody about like, like combat like that without, you know, due cause or just prep for that. You know, one way or another. Uh-huh. And I used to ask, like, tell me about the war. Tell me what you had to do. All that. I used to push for it. But when she passed, like, I always remember that. I always felt like that generation, if they didn't stand up and fight on the ground. And, and pull everything they had together within a very short period of time per for that, it w- I wouldn't be here. It's not my opinion. I wouldn't be here right. if they hadn't stood up and got the work and protected the island, you know, and, and manned whatever thousands of civil- civilian boats on the south coast within 24, 36 hours, whatever they did, it, they did it in. That kind of movement, that generation stood up and did it. Right, and so, um, like when she passed, that I got like the target tattoo for my dad, so that he knew that I supported his mother. Ah. Right, that's it. That's kind of what it is. But yeah, that's a song for the city for sure. I and mean, it plays at Liverpool games too, and it's on the Iron Gates at the front of Liverpool Football Club. Oh, okay. So right across the old Iron Gates, it says "Never Walk Alone." Like the way across it, eighty-nine. Anyway, there's a huge like. Uh, um, football disaster. People died. They over. They like put a, over. a stampede or whatever. Yeah, it was. A, it was a. It was a, a. A game between an Italian team and Liverpool, and they were they were one of the best teams in Europe at the time, and Liverpool was one of the best teams in England at the time. So it was a big game, and the and the uh, the police allowed or they allowed more people into the stadium than they should have. Oh shit. And pushing people at the front, a lot of kids, old people, and, and people that were right at the front that had been there got crushed against the fences and, and died. And quite a lot of them died and they killed. It's called a Heisel Stadium disaster. One of yeah. my friends was uh, one of my friends that played for my team, my, my uh, um, Sunday League team, was in that crowd and died at that. Right? And like, you know, so I went to his funeral and his name's like engraved on the front of the. Liverpool Football Club Stadium, you know, of all the people that lost their lives and that, you know, right below the you'll never walk alone thing. So it just hits hard. That does to answer the question. To answer that question. That's like it was a personal local song that resonates. That's the song you used in. Uh, yeah, what was it? Old, Sorry old or something. 
Yeah, really sorry or something. How did you initially meet Lemmy? Like, what was the relation? Like, in the beginning relationship, was it through Vans or like some promotional thing or like, huh? Escape, Escape uh, contest. Escape contest. Yeah, in Germany. Oh. In Germany, one of the, I think it was Dortmund contest. Um, they were playing that night in in Dortmund, the night of like or the weekend of the skate contest. So Lemmy came to the contest to watch it. He came to the skate contest to check it out because mm. he had a big, probably he, he had a big, um, he had a show in a different part of the same venue that weekend, I think is what it was. I'm trying to remember, it was a long time ago, right? They, the details of it, basically yeah. he, went to, he went to the contest in Germany and he was playing next door or in the same building or down the road, I can't remember. Right. And as he came to check it out because he'd never seen the skate contest and what else are they going to do when they get off the tour bus when they're playing in five hours or something. So he came in and I, I remember walking up to him, just talking to him. I just walked up to him and said, hey, you know, I'm Jeff. Like, it's pretty rad that you came here, you know. So that you're here. What do you think? Like, yeah. Like, that's how, when I first met him. I think, you, I think you lined up uh, Jake doing that Ask the Felper interview with him. Yeah. Dude, that yeah. was that was a that yeah, was think, such I, a I, highlight I, for Jake. Like that was the one time where I saw Jake where he might have been a little nervous and fanning out. Yeah. Like he's like, "Well, hey, I, I mean, if you let me for Thrasher, yeah, remember? yeah, yeah." I asked the, the last question I had was I was sweating. <laughs> My last question on that was, "Have you ever had sexual relations with a man?" Because oh. I, I read everything on the internet about interviews that they've done with him. And I'm thinking, I'm going to interview Lemmy. i got to interview Lemmy. Yeah. Right? i got to ask him a question. I didn't have a lot of prep time for it because Lemmy just says, yeah. He used to just say, yes, I'll do it. When do you want to do it? Thursday, let's go. And you, then you have to get there Thursday. Oh, shit. Right? Like, so he was pretty sick like that. And, um, and it did happen, like, really, really fast like that. So I had to prep real quick and go, shit, i got to write questions to, to ask him. I was sweating on that. Like the whole interview went fine. I'm like, this, this is fine. Like, easy. He's, he's, he's a person. He's answering like a person. And the last question, I just thought, this could go left field right now. He could just go fuck you. Yeah. He could just, you're right. And uh, and I wasn't really drinking at the time. I don't think. And he made me drink uh, two shots of whiskey at the start of the interview. <laughs> Get the liquid he, courage. <laughs> before he'd allow me to interview him. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry. So that I wasn't sharper than him. He's smart, right? Yeah. Um, you learn those little tricks, right? If you've been interviewed 400,000 times. Uh, but yeah, no, he handled it. He handled sick, it. dude. You know, I, I stayed in touch with him, Greg, like really like the whole the whole time. If you've heard of the cabin with the Beatles, right? It's a famous club that they pay, played at. Yeah. Let me take the train from North Wales as a teenager, right? To Liverpool on the train and take a bus, blah, 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 to get all the way to Lime Street. And then he would walk from there, through everywhere where we where we all skate now, or grew up skating, and go all the way to the cabin. And he'd walk past like two doors away from where the first skate shop was. Right, so when he when Lemmy told me that story, yeah, I used to go to Liverpool, I used to walk up that street and that street, and I know exactly where he'd go. And he, he told me all that. It's amazing. And, uh, he loved those bands, and he loved, he really liked the Beatles. Yeah, and he was a Beatles fan. We worked with him on band stuff and other stuff, you know, throughout that time. But mostly, you know, we, we worked on them with bands because we did a lot of band shoes, my shoes, but they also did a lot of slip-ons and skate highs and, you know, all the warp tour stuff was happening at that time a lot too. So all of those bands that were, you know, from that generation, but like were maybe more the icons from that generation. Yeah. They were the ones that were, you know, people were re-remembering them. Right, kind of like a new generation of kids was finding out who, who you know, who Judas Priest was. Yep. Right. Like, and uh, and 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 more appreciative of that music than before, which is sick. The nineties, right? Like, it took, you know, that some of those eighties rock bands that were struggling through the late eighties into the early nineties, and it helped it, it leveled them out. Motorhead was always is always super thankful for that, like, because it does like skateboarding. It does understand what skateboarding is. It does think it's cool and punk, and it, yeah. it, wanna, it, it does it does resonate with its music, right? So they they understood that you know those that community needs to be together, and so they were they've always been awesome to work with. But we did a load of shoes with bands. We did like 10, 15 
different motorhead shoes for vans, like with some of my signature shoes, but with skate highs, with with slip-ons, with, with old schools. And then Lemmy, these are, if anyone can find these on eBay, it's sick. Lemmy did some for um, for a charity. He hand drew some like little jokes and wrote some stuff on napkins and stuff like that, and they put them on some shoes. Oh. And it was for a, a uh, I think it was for a children's, if I remember right, a charity, maybe from the UK. I actually lined it out. I knew the person that was at the charity, and they reached out to me. And they'd already had like Paul McCartney on there, Bob Dylan, like like I worked, you know, I stayed in touch with them. Yeah. So yeah. And he you know, wrote a, I, he wrote a song for you, right? He wrote a song for for, for a video. Music, a video uh, at a much later date, um, you know. Uh, and, he, and and they've always just opened up their music to me on a dime, right? right. So they're wrong people to work with. The management was awesome, you know. Um, they did a big thing with Lakai too, not that long ago. And Riley Hawk. Oh yeah, right? yep. Yeah, like you know, and they they, they called me up like. Is Lakai legit? Is it legit? You yeah. Know, Riley Hawk's legit. Is I'm like, yeah, it's legit. Like, yeah. should they great? Riley's rap. You know, yeah. you should do stuff with them. Um, but we were we were planning a van drop kind of at the same time. Uh, so we had to look at the calendars because otherwise it would have been like Lakai doesn't know, Vans didn't know, and the two collections dropped the same month or within like three months. Uh, so I had to navigate a little bit of that because we were planning on doing a big forty year. Ace of Spades kind of deal. Like it was an idea of doing some like product around that because it was mm. 40 years of Ace of Spades 2020. Yeah. Which is true. Um, so I communicated with them quite a lot on that so that no one got to the, like we never ended up doing anything. Like bands never ended up doing anything um, during that period because it just didn't line out. And then, you know, the guy did all of their apparel and stuff like that with them. They were great to work with, truly, just, you know, rad management. And, that was one of the major reasons, Greg, like why I stayed in touch with them like that whole time. Like I was friends with, you know, with their management, you know, um, Steve Luna, who was um, responsible for getting Lammy to his, his interviews and responsible for getting him places on time, responsible for making sure that he had what he needed for any scenario, right? Um, he lives in Long Beach and I became oh. pretty good friends with him and his okay. wife, his family, they're great people. And so that's how the relationship went. And then their manager, um, um, their manager's a guy named Todd Singerman, and, uh, and Lemmy trusted him, and that's in music, right? Like, Lem Lemmy trusted him, but Todd's always been a man of his word, and, uh, and he lives in Whittier, probably last time. Oh, Lemmy shit. Lived yeah, so we stayed in touch. It's, you know, it's always, I mean, even when Lemmy passed, you know, like, we stayed in touch about, you know, what we can do, you know, what we can do to help the estate, to help the things that Lemmy had and all of those kinds of things, how they get handled, mm. right? He had some amazing stuff, and I, uh, I haven't yeah. seen a lot of where it went any, you know, he has he had, he had a lot of artifacts. Yeah, he was things, a collector, right? He had things he picked up along the way, mm. and, uh, you know, and, um, you know, so I was, I was, you know, I stayed in touch with them, trying to be as helpful as I could. Also, like that legacy of that band, right? And the association with Skate, it, it's, it has a history with it, you know? Heavy. I'm sorry to say, but half of the Thrasher logos are influenced by it. Oh, right? yeah. It was Jake's right? favorite. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and the it mentality. was either Motorhead or ACDC. Those were the, those were the anthems. If you look into it, you look into it, you look at the writing, it's articulate, right? The stories, the, the songs were written, written like that. It's poetry. Right. But then the, the way that they're delivered, you just think of it as a oh, loud rock and roll. It's a, it's more than that with Judas Priest and with, with Motorhead and with Black Sabbath. Isn't it like that? Like I was felt like that shit. And For I'm, sure. I don't know. So I just want to help keep that dream alive because I'm selfish. That's sick, dude. What was your first sponsor? Was it something out there in England? Uh, my first sponsor was actually a board company that my friends made up. Oh, really? And we made our own boards. It's called Apple Orchard. It had these little Apple core logos on them, which actually, looking back, was a pretty fucking sick little logo. Uh. But my friends, we made a couple of T-shirts. We made these like handmade screened shirts. Um, 
that was the first time, like first boards that I did. And then after that, it was so my first board sponsor was uh, Deathbox. It was my first board sponsor. Oh, okay. See. Yeah, my first shoe shoe sponsor was Airwalk. Uh huh. My first truck sponsor. You were going, was, right? Like going, I think. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Um, you know, but it was just flow, you know, on that. And, uh, and yeah, but that was it, I think. Were you getting boxes sent to England? I got going boxes sent to England. Did you? Yeah. That's yeah. a pretty big deal, right? Like, I mean, as a kid, are you... You don't... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do remember that. I do remember that. And, um, and uh, yeah, I remember making that, making those calls, but on that. Exactly. I, 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 uh, it was terrifying. Uh. Right? Like, I was, like, 13 years old, something like that, and calling up, saying, hey, oh, I, need some tr- I need some trucks. Right. You know, and you understand my accent because I'm from way north, you know, northwest <laughs> coast, and my accent's all gravelly and freaking a mess. Um, yeah, I remember, like, you'd have to really prep when you'd call and go, okay, I need to look at, because England is, you know, eight hours ahead of the U.S., so I'd always have to call early in the morning, and if I got a vo- back then, there was no cell phones, right? So you'd get a voicemail, you'd leave a message for the team manager, and you'd maybe a package would show up in two months. Mm. That was it. Yeah, it's you know, taken, there was a, it's taken a while. Like with, but that was kind of it. Right. It kinda it. After I moved here, like the, the, the sponsors that I picked up were just people I started skating with and stuff like that. Uh-huh. You know, like people who I. Who were some of the guys that you were like innovators that fired you up? Like you were looking up to as role models, like, uh, oh, maybe your first photo you put on a wall or a video part you couldn't keep out of the VCR. We went from video to video, and each time video uh, influences there, I'd look back at that guy, and we look back at their stuff to learn a bit more. We only, had a, we only had a look into a pro skater's life, right? Like, I what, saw a few pictures of, of, of Eric Dressen, right? Like, in the mag, and right. then, like, a couple of video parts. But prior to Speed Freaks, right? Like, that, you hadn't seen Dressen skate street like that. Right. And when I see it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's kind of like how I want to ride in the streets, yeah, like that. Right, so it, it shifted from different guys, but very first was was um, was Mattis. It was the very, and Danny Way, like almost synonymous, like the same time. Okay. Like, because I saw, you know, the early, first video I saw was Savannah Slammer 3. And I thought I watched the whole video. And years later, I thought I watched the whole video. I only had a recording of half of the video. So I missed half of the video. That was such a um, big video. And there's so many guys in it. Yeah. So if you've never seen anything else them, you've never skated before, you don't know their names, you're learning the names through Savannah Slammer. Like, oh, shit, that's what Corey O'Brien looks like. Right? Like, that was that for a lot of kids like me that didn't see him come up because I live in a foreign country. I lived in a, a different country. Uh-huh. Um, right? So, but it was, it was, it was Natus first. Because when I put the skate video in the house, my mother liked it if that was on, because she was like the blonde surfer dude. She was okay with what having that on the screen, uh-huh. right? Like, same with Roscoe. She was good with Roscoe being okay. up on the screen. <laughs> she liked the surfer guys. Seriously, I used to watch Roscoe's parts because I could sit there and watch a skate video, and my mother would let me. Ah, right. Because some of the music was like too loud while she was doing the dishes or whatever she was doing in the house when I was a kid. And I've watched them so many times, Greg. I've, I've watched, I'd watch a video, rewind it, watch it again, rewind it, watch it again, rewind the trick, watch the trick again, rewind it 85 times, then the trick never plays good again. And that was me. You know, I loved skate videos and like, I loved watching them. And I was the kid that slept with his board. And mm. like, once I put it up, it was fire. You know, that was it. So Nas, uh, sorry, Nas first, because he was the first guy I saw do street skating that I could relate to. Like I looked at it and went, oh, he's jumping off of, uh, you know, a wall that's five foot high doing a spin. Like I couldn't do that, but like I see walls around my house that you could do that or around yeah. the, 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 where I live. Or the curb cut. You know, so I think for a lot of kids, that's that was the first draw to Nas, was that he he had a really good video part before anyone, a lot of people did. So he was the first on, on the street that, you know, had it all kind of thing, like looked like it was a complete package. So I had a Nats kitten board. I had two Corey O'Brien boards. Corey O'Brien was my, like, 
um, second and third board. I had two in a row. Ah. First board was the Toxic Team, but that was because there was only two boards in the skate shops to choose from. They uh-huh. had a full skates dead guys and a Toxic Team model. And that were the only boards in the skate shop oh, called shit. Probe Record. And uh, so I, not knowing and being a little kid, I didn't want the black board with like white, black and white photos of guys' heads that I didn't even know. I knew Elvis. I'd only get new Gigi Allen at the time or whoever else was on it, right? Um, Sid and Nancy or Sid or something <laughs> like that. I didn't know that then. Yeah, I knew yeah. Sid, it was it's, uh, even at that age. But um, the, the call for graphic. And then, then I had a Corey O'Brien, then another Corey O'Brien, then like a Max Kitten. And then I really wanted a Danny Way. But during the time I had those first pure ports, I wanted that Danny Way. I just couldn't get it. Yeah, so... That's what I, I, that was my first board. You asked me about influences, like dude, like dudes I psyched on at first. Right, they, they were the few, really. And then, and then it went to Dressen. I had a Dr- Eric Dressen pup size, the white one, which was a Dogtown board. Oh, yeah, I had a bunch of those. You can see I was influenced by like that, those dudes early, earlier on, like when before you know before I rode for Santa Cruz, mm-hmm. and um, you know I was into Cardiel when he rode for Dogtown. Too, oh, like, yeah. right, but it wasn't me. His friends of mine, like, dude, you know, he's so sick. Go see this dude who rides for Dogtown. Same with Markovich when Markovich rode for Dogtown. Oh yeah, I remember, yeah. Early on, I remember looking at him, going, "Fuck, I want to see him skate." Like the photos, he looks bad. Looks like a good right. skater. My friend did Markovich's first graphic. It was my friend's first graphic that he ever did, and he's like, "Oh, I did a Dogtown graphic. It's this dude named Markovich." And I yeah. was like, ah, oh, never heard of him. And but since he did the graphic, we looked into him. And we're like, oh, that dude's fucking good. Yeah, it's like where I lived, we didn't have a lot of skate shops, right? So I didn't see a lot of graphics. I did I, when I needed to get a board. You knew what was in the shop because you were in the skate shop every couple of days, looking at the boards, wishing you had money to buy a board. So when you right. finally had money saved up and. You know, got close to like, ah, I wonder, I need a little bit more. My mom will give me a little bit more. I can squeak a board this weekend. Going to get a new board this weekend, maybe. You're just begging your mother. Ah. Um, so most of the time I was prepped because there was no like, hey, I want this board in the shop at order and it's there in two days like you can have right now, you know? So there was a lot of stuff I wanted and couldn't get. Like I was a fan of Scott Oster. Oh, like yeah. I liked his skating. and um, Style. And uh but I was, um, yeah, influenced by those dudes more than more than most. And then Julian Stranger during that period too. So when I was really get it, like liked watching dress and then, uh, that style of kind of like street skating, when I started to see like um, Speed Freaks and those kinds of videos. And Julian never, skating with Nottis. <laughs> yeah, but you don't. You only ever saw like snippets of Julian with yeah. that or video and stuff like that. And you went, I need to see Julian Stranger skate. Uh huh. You have to wait for like Reason for Living to come out, and then he just teased you, right? Yeah. And you saw Reason for Living, you went, "That's the best video part." He just rode down the hill, and I'm juiced up, and he just rode down the hill. Yeah. Like, now I really need more. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? You know, little kid here, like, give it to me. Drop in on the ramp and show me that shit. Mm. Um, but I was fired up by that. Like, I'd watch Reason for Living part because you remember Nats had come in and cross over him. Right on the same hill, bombing it. That yeah. bit of it, and going to Nats's part. Yeah, that psyched me out. And it's funny that you see that shit. And years later, you know, when I started skating with Ed, you know, and started skating a lot with Ed, and Ed was on like a high level, and I was learning, learning skate, but we didn't skate the same at all. It's like that. Like that's what I. That's what I wanted. To, that relationship with the guys that I skated with. Uh, you know, to fire it up, like yep. you see in the videos, but on the street live. Right. You know, at any moment. You know, so that that's got what got me like just totally fired up. Yeah, fuck yeah. Guys have it now. Some guys have it now. You know, like there's still guys that that have that, not skate like that. You know, Ronnie skates like that. Yeah, Ronnie's sick. Yeah. Delfino. Yeah, Delfino. There's a ton of them. You yeah. know, a lot of the a lot of the guys that are just ripping the streets to pieces right now. Um, all right. You know, have all the right DNA. Keep it going, guys. I was gonna tell you. I don't know if I ever told you this, but you introduced me to Sebado because your Uno part. I remember like the music was so perfect. And like back then we used to watch the parts that we liked over and over and over. And that song just boom, boom. It was, it was either Ty or like Ted Newsom or somebody had that influence. Right. And I didn't 
the song. It was an yeah. awesome one. It's a great band. I listened to the band at the time, but I didn't have any hand in, in putting that there, right? Yeah, um, and he was in Dinosaur <laughs> Jr. And it was like, oh, it was starting to like open up your eyes to like the indie music scene. Yeah. Like, like who's or like this? more stuff could be there that's that good that you don't know about. Or right. that you make it yeah. more into. Yeah. For sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I thought that was always really cool. Um, yeah, awesome, man. <clears throat> I was also wondering when you first kind of grew up in skating, did anyone ever mix you up with Sean Goff? No. No, he, he, Sean's way like the generation before. But I the, na say the, the well, name Goff and Jeff, cool like, man. yeah. You're a beautiful man. And, uh, no, sure, he was a total ripper, but he, he, um, he was older than I was. He lived like down south. He's from kind of, Oxford area and so I never even seen him we always joke within the friends we're like what if uh Jeff spelt his name backwards like Jeff the Fedge Hedges and it was Foe Edge <laughs> yeah, yeah that's good maybe I'll we'll do that it Jeff the Foe Edge to... Roly <laughs> I will tell you one story about those guys there's a Santa Cruz demo in the north of England Mm. I went to it and I and I remember get it was one of them demos you go to and as you're on the train it's already raining, and you, right? So I was going to see like the, the Santa Cruz team outdoors, like so seven foot high metal ramp. So I'm yeah. just thinking this is going to be insane. This is going to be they're going to be eight, eight inverts. They're going to freaking be doing Madonnas and lean to tails and and so yeah, but it rained the whole way on the train. We got the they showed up. The ramp was wet. Um, they ended up skating for about. Uh, half an hour because it dried up for half an hour and then it rained again. But Klaus Grabke gave me a set of wheels. I think Fedge was there. Grabke was there. Jeff Kendall was there. Tom Knox was there. Huh. First time I ever saw a nollie was that day. Sick. Tom Knox was warm enough while the ramp was wet on the flat bottom, doing straight, hitting the nose down on the ground, doing straight up nose ollies. We were just looking going, he just stood on his board and we, what the fuck is happening? Yeah. How can you make the ollie go forward <laughs> if your foot can't grip the front of the board? What the fuck? Yeah. Freaked us out. Wow. And was that? Day, like, oh, he's a genius. Oh, shit. Like, he was. And then he ripped. Ripped the ramp like Tom Knox did. Like, he looked. He skated like he did in the video. Ah. On that demo with the same skate high vans and, like, freaking probably gray shorts and a blue Santa Cruz shirt and shaved head. Yeah. You know, look. Tom Knox influenced a lot of people with that look. For sure. Yeah. All the way out of Bakersfield. Yeah. Did, was that some of the early Americans that you saw in person in in England? Was the Santa Cruz guys or was it the Powell guys or who? who? I sort of, in, during the, you know, the few years that I was, starting to travel the first few years of skating i didn't really leave the city because i was a little tiny kid so i couldn't travel that far yeah um but when i started to travel when i was i don't know 14 15 like oh, i traveled everywhere across the whole country like, uh, all over slept in bushes everywhere and anywhere uh, on anything didn't matter <laughs> yeah you know, we figured it out um we did that a lot and uh you know so I, I like where i'm like liverpool where i'm from like that skate scene is pretty good about wanting to go to skate contest wanting to go to demos wanting to go to new skate parks like all the local skaters were sick you know all the guys i grew up with they were always just wanted to go and do stuff right like go and find a new spot and like go, go to another city that we've never street skated before and just skate all over it and get on the last train home skate all the way home yeah and um <clears throat> on that so um you know that's when i started like bounce around but it was only i saw a uh we saw a Santa Cruz demo, um, you know, with Kendall, uh, Kendall, Tom Knox, Klaus Grabke, and I think Veg too. I can't remember. There was one or two other dudes there. Uh -huh. And then uh, a Hay Street Life demo. Oh. Sean Sheffy, Colby <sighs> Carter, Ron Allen, I think. That's game changer. Um, Colby Carter was sick. And uh, Sean Sheffy, Animal. Uh -huh. Gave me a t-shirt. You want to see the t-shirt? Yes, you still got it. So sick. Wow. Damn. What year? Through before my... life even started. Before the light video came out. So That's it must so have been right sick. You still have it. 
yeah, it's a size large. He gave it to me. And I remember he gave it to me. Oh, my God, that's the sickest shirt. And I was the smallest kid you've oh, ever dude. seen in the world. I needed an extra, extra small. So I didn't wear it. I kept it new until I moved to the U.S. when I was 18 and stayed in my parents' house. And then last summer, um, no, sorry, about five years ago, I brought it back. And it's been in my closet since then. I wore it once. And skate. I shot a photo with a Costa from a Thrasher interview. Uh, no, it was a freaking skateboard mag uh-huh. interview. Um, wearing it and sent it to Sean to trip him out. He just go, what? You gave me that, Sean, when I was 14 years old, many, many years ago. And here it is right now in Mount Baldy doing a kickflip. <laughs> Dude, that's but, uh, amazing. That was a demo I went to. So I, was in, I saw Sheffy. And then, you know, a couple of years after that, I saw... Um, uh, there was a Plan B demo. Oh. Plan B. So I saw Mike Carroll, um, Rick Howard um, on that demo. And who else was there from Plan B? I can't remember. Was and Danny another, there or no? Another demo was um, I saw Alan Peterson. This is, the, this is a good one. Um, Alan Peterson, uh, Ron Chapman, um, uh, Cardiel, Barnes. In Shrewsbury, I saw that, and uh, Alan Peterson. So good. I'm pretty sure Guns was there too. Yeah, and then the only other person I saw skate was Ed Templeton. I saw a TV demo just with Ed. Yeah, and uh, so that was the only people I saw in person. But not like you'd seen them, but it wasn't. It was an hour of seeing them skate, and that's yeah. it. Yeah, so, yeah. I saw the level and went the level's much higher. You know, the level of the pro live is high. You know, like he doesn't step off his board kind of thing. And like we 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 um you know, we want just want to skate like 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 that. Um but yeah, but uh, yeah, definitely seeing Cardi L on that skate at that you know, that age. Oh, and I was still, like my balls hadn't dropped, right? So because John's I don't know, John a few I don't know how old John is, but he's like a few years older than I am, probably. Uh-huh. You know, um, and that difference of like someone not quite going through their teenage years and somebody already being a man—that was me at that demo. You know, kind of thing where my balls were just starting to drop. I was still a little kid. Uh-huh. I was watching the level of skating that, you know, was insane. Fuck, insane. those are the days. Yeah, Jeffy yeah. was cool to me too. He was like. It was quiet, but I was influenced by the way that you were treated. Like, Klaus Grabke gave me a set of wheels because I had the smallest wheels at that Santa Cruz demo. Right? So Here's some 66s. Like, oh, <laughs> they were. 66s? T-bone. Right? He said, who's got the smallest wheels here? Whoever's got the smallest wheels, I'm going to give him some wheels. And I'm just, like, I had some crusty old wheels that probably try to fix on a lathe or something in my dad's garage um but they were small so he gave me the wheels and i remember he gave me them but i'm a little kid yeah. like this there's 66 and they're softies right like so i was stoked but in the same breath i'm like how am i gonna ride them what do i do i tried to ride them i ended up selling them because they just didn't fit the board i was getting real by every 10 seconds but he was cool as fuck to me ah, see. you know what i mean like Klaus Gray, he was super rat. Like he gave the, the kid with the littlest wheels the set of the biggest wheels he had at the demo. And huh. So I was, and so I had a good influence with pros before I, you know, before I moved to the U.S. Like no one was a bit. Were you aware of who these guys were from like videos or magazines, or were you being introduced uh, to them? Yeah, at? So yeah. we didn't know who Sean Sheffy was. No. Sean showed up at the yeah. We kind of like knew his name and you, but we didn't. We didn't know what he was capable of doing. Right. You know, he had like two tricks in Speed Freaks or something like that, right? Uh, like he had a couple of tricks here and there. And like, it was before so the life him. video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he was wearing the same clothes he was wearing in the life video, like the Limpies and a white mm. t shirt, you know, uh, that. And um, like he was rifling through his bag on, on, on his on the trip. So I got to see like a skate trip, like the van, the back of the van, and like a pro's bag. How people travel. I was never on the road. Right? You see that shit, and then years later, you remember that you've seen it. Yeah. And then one, like, I remember Sean had, like, a duffel bag, and he was rummaging through all of his stickers and shit to give stuff to kids that he didn't need. 
you know, like that. And um, he was generous. Yeah. And respectful to the kids that were there. And we appreciate it because, you know, it went a long way at the time with, with us, you know. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's take a quick little break and hear from some of our friends, and we will be right back. John Wapo, where's my son? Where's my son? Where's Wapo? Hey, it's Corey at Blue Plate, 3218 Mission Street. Come see us. Meatloaf, fried chicken, deviled eggs, Dollar Olympia beers. We're here every day of the week. We got a garden and we got smiles on our faces. Come let us make you happy. And now, another first impression with Timothy Donald McKenney. First impression, Jeff Rally on Talking Schmidt. It was in Munster. And Poncho actually talks about it in his pod. And it really was a cool deal. When me and Poncho go and walk up the stairs up to the drop-in bank and right on the tops, Jeff Rally. And I guess Rally and Poncho must have caught each other's eyes because instantly it was like, Poncho, Jeff, and they started talking. It was like, wow, dude, these two really know each other. And you could tell the look in Rally's eyes. He knew Poncho was a ripper. And I'm going, how does this guy know? Uh, I realized they were both on Volcom. They both went on tour. It's the tour where Poncho gets called Wee Man all through Trans World. Pits the shit out of me. But uh, either way, Rally knew what a champion Poncho was because I saw it in his eyes. And when I saw it in his eyes, I went, damn, Rally really is a genuine, badass fucking man. Anyways, this is always a pleasure. I love you guys. Stay up late. Hi, this is Frankie Hill, and you're with Talkin' Schmidt. Let's talk a little bit about how you, um, when you got on Vans. Like how it all went down that you, they put you on Vans. Uh, well, I rode for Airwolf before Vans, right? Yeah. Uh, for a, quite a long time, and like. When I was growing up, it was just those two shoe companies, Airwalk and Vans. Like you were either going to wear a cup sole from Airwalk or a balkanized shoe from Vans. Right. Right. So your options, and and um, you know, and uh, and so where I was from, it was cold. Right. So often you got wet, often you got cold in the winter, and we needed. So there was a there was a a lot of us wore Airwalks to keep our feet warm, or because they lasted a little bit longer. Right at the time. Uh -huh. and those kind of things and um and some of my favorite pro pros rode for them matt hensley and, you know Dan danny way and, and indeed tony hall everyone rode for him uh -huh. right and so um i rode for a walk and so I, I i i grew up wearing just those two shoes pretty much you know as a skater i both i wore both yep. whatever was that skated well and um and the Airwalk shoes just went in a direction that was not scalable, you know? And I tried to help them fix it. I tried to be a team player and loyal for quite a few years, even at a young kid's age like that, where I was given a pro shoe and I probably shouldn't have had a pro shoe at that age, mm. you know? Like I was given a pro shoe pretty early. Um, and, uh, but they just weren't able to, they weren't able to make good product at the time. Right, and it was frustrating. But it was some of the same people that were there when it was a great brand huh. early on. You know, uh, Dan Sturt was still helping with the photography and a lot oh. of the content. 
right? And he was actually doing a lot of like the video content for them at the time. So my loyalty to like Dan in photo and video, right? Like riding for Airwalk was, so that was there, as well as my loyalty to what the brand had been when he could make good shoes, right? So I tried to be there and it just got to the point where it's like, they can't do it. They're not gonna do it. And I, I don't can't wait around anymore. You know, they just can't make, the product was getting worse, you know? So I looked at like the, who I'd want to ride for or if anyone would even want to sponsor me, you know? And I spoke to a couple of companies at that time and which was hugely flattering, rad brands that were, that are still around today. And, um, and not, it just didn't, nothing felt right. Like it felt at the time, I felt like, fuck, like, I don't like any skate shoes. And that's not like me. I love skateboarding. I didn't like any fucking skate shoes. They saw. Huh. They also, I tried to wear other, other skate shoes that even to see if I liked them. And no, they weren't that good. I felt like the shoes that we had before that ridiculous explosion of puffy shoes were better than the ones that we were trying to make. Yeah. So I felt like we were going backwards, you know? And so I just went, well, if it's not broke, then why fix it? So I was like, fuck it, I'm going to wear what I'm musically influenced by right now. And I was, I don't know what year that was, 98 or something like that. And um, I just approached bands, like straight up cold, cold approach bands. I'd spoken to them a little bit, uh, I think the year before. And there was like, they were set up the way that they were set up, you know. But it just hit a point where I went with their work. I'm like, I'm going to leave. I'm just going to go and do something else because I can't get shoes I need to skate in. So they can't make them for me and I'm struggling to buy them from other brands or, or get free flow from other brands and, and like them. Like I, the other brand's shoes were really slippy, right? Like they just were, like I felt like. And I was, you know, um, I was struggling with that. So that's kind of how, how it happened. I just thought, well, you know, what, what, what's going to work? And I just, the only thing I could think of was they just did those original errors that were the first skate shoe and that's what i wanted to wear because at the time like from a fashion sense like personally like i you know was young and wanted to when i wasn't skating still wear the same gear still yeah. feel like a skater not change my gear and put on a pair of nike running shoes that's the exact opposite of what i'm saying i wanted uh -huh. i wanted a casual shoe that was a skate shoe and so I started wearing the Aero, you know, that shoe there, because um, I had them when I was younger, and they still sold them in band stores around Southern California, original made in USA one. So I just went there, skated in one pair, and went, oh, my, yeah. This That's is it. it. Okay. Yeah. I went, the most important thing is the grip. It's yeah. the connection from the product <laughs> to the skateboard. The shoe to the skateboard is the grip. That's what makes this work. And it's not just like the compound or the rubber, it's the way the shoe's made. And it, in, in my head, I just thought, like, Levi 501s. Yeah. In my head. All those ads they sold you when you were growing up, where you, you know, the handsomest dude in town would go and get a pair of Levi's and walk down the high street, get in his own bathtub with his pants on with no shirt on, he's ripped, and then his jeans would mold to the shape of his body. And you could see his junk when he left, and all the old ladies would cringe. The commer that commercial, mm. I saw that with Vans. I felt that's what Vans is. Vans is like a great American brand that fucking has something that's special, and the way that these shoes are made is perfect for skating. Uh, Let's do that. Yep. Let's do that. And so I wore them for like a year. So made me say errors. Scott Sismus, who works in in the surf team at Vans, now still works at Vans. Scott, uh -huh. he would like drive around Southern California buying me shoes from Vans retail stores, what was left of the old inventory, made in USA inventory, and I would do the same thing. And it became kind of fun uh -huh. of like, these shoes are like 25 bucks to buy, right? They're the best skate shoes ever, right? I wore through them in three days, right? Because they're just old stock from 15 years ago, most of them. Uh -huh. But they work and I can skate better and I'm confident and it's making me learn tricks quick because I hadn't wore shoes like that for quite a few years at that point. And the Vans that they were making just before that weren't the original Vans. They were, the, the, the build of them was a different compound of rubber, right? Like the, than what we did after when we started remaking bulk shoes, the compound was back to where it was originally. So that interim of before I rode for the brand 
a lot of the vaults weren't done right. That's the best way of putting it. They weren't made right. And you might have put them on at the time too. I did too, meaning I was trying to put a pair that were production on at the same time and going, this one right here that everyone's forgotten about, this is it. This doesn't work the same way. Huh. We need to improve it right away. And so when I got the chance to do my first shoe, the first thought was, how do we improve that product? It's the grips already there, so let's look at, and then I remembered the sock liner of all bands used to crumble. Yeah. Right? Like both ones. I'm like, nope, we'll put the first comfortable sock liner. And then they never had any padding around the ankle. Almost none. Like the skate high, all those don't have a lot of padding. I thought, what if we put just a little bit, a little bit more than that, but not as much as what people want right now? That's what it should look like. Mm -hmm. Then it looked like a band that's been upgraded. Mm -hmm. Right? That was my first shoe, and that's yeah. why that's why I rode for bands and why I wanted to ride for bands and why I continue to ride for bands after that is because they listened. They listened to the skater that said this shoe is grippier than this shoe, and I can do better tricks on this than this. Yeah, and they made they made it. It's so you know, sick. They didn't know, and they didn't say you're wrong, and they didn't say, well, the designers have said the compound of the rubber is the same, so they should feel the same. They delved yep. into DNA, and 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 they when they looked at it, they went, it works, and so they went through their whole catalog of classics and and kind of re-energized and rebuilt them with with that you know with the idea of that the original was 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 correct. How can we improve that now? Right. You know, yeah. You ba you basically reintroduced Vulcanized to the skate shoe. Fixed. Well, it was already it was out on the market, but the it, the connection between the business and the athlete was off, uh, right? Or whatever you want to call it. I don't call myself. I call myself an athlete physically because yeah. we move all the time. But I don't look at myself the same way. Like that. It's twenty four seven, right? Uh, I skate in my car over here. So does that make me right? Like, yeah. You know, but. Like, and I was pretty anal about my product at that age. Most dudes are when you're like 20 to 23. You're a little more picky. You're still just, your you're, you're, you're masculine freaking confidence is like, needs adjusting <laughs> at that age. Um, you know, so once it worked, you're like, you're never going to go back, right? Like, if you do a good kickflip on a board, and you go, ah, a, I feel good on that board. You yeah. want to want it. And that's what it was, is, is, uh, is the shoes said, like, we're better, we're going to make you better at skating, you feel more confident. And that's freaking priceless. When I was like 21, I didn't quite see what I should be doing, skating, you know? And um, and then I seen it when we started that path, you know? And I started working with Dan Sturt, you know? Dan was shooting all of my first band's ads, you know? So Dan brought a level of creativity to So it. Dan kind of traveled with you. He went from... He went from Airwalk to Vans with you? No, not with me. He worked independently for Airwalk. No, not day. with you, but kind of simultaneously. I begged him to shoot photos. Um, please, Dan, I love you. You're the best. Please. Um, you're my hero. Such a crazy dude. When I was growing up, I looked at it and looked down the bottom right corner and went, damn it, that guy shot it again. <laughs> and um, no, like we work well together. I love that. Like his, his personality and his character and who he is, is it's not for everybody, but it's for me. I like mm. him, you know, and, uh, and, and much like Jake, he's been a good friend. He, he was a good friend to me and he's a good, still a good friend to me today. And he still checks in on me and, he, and, he's, and he's still right about the same shit that Jake was right about. Shit. You know, he's, he's wildly broad with some other stuff, right? I'm a very colorful character. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's a now, good way to describe him. Jake has an immense amount of talent, you know? Yeah, so it was a, it, once Dan brought a lot to that too, because I said that to Dan, like when we were first shooting with him, I'm like the, the Hensley photos, like the, the portraits, the stuff that I remember that resonate but when you push the boundaries, when a guy, remember the Markovich double page uh, still life photo in Transvaal, right? It was the first time the water gap, it was Mark Rich's interview in the mag. Okay. And it was a double page, that black and white photograph, Dan Sturt one, and, uh, of Markovich, Ollie in this water gap. 
over this like basically water cavern, you know? Well, you could only see his board, his feet, and about six inches of his legs. His whole top of his body was at the top of the frame out of the photo, right? He wanted you to look at the water. Yeah. He wanted you to look at the, the space that was there. Damn. That photo. I remember that and went, damn, we, let's do stuff like that, you know? All right? Like, so every time we shoot a photo, I'm not going to question what you're doing. Do it. You know, like, and, and if we have an idea for something, we'll talk, which we did a few times. We did a couple of wacky portraits and like, we did, you ever see that grizzly bear photo that we did? Yeah. With the grizzly bear? That's real. That's a 10 foot grizzly. No, that's totally real. A 10 foot grizzly bear at six foot behind me, <laughs> right? And I got five minutes with it in the complete open wild in the mountains. The front Whoa. door of my head, Right? Like I know an animal trainer and they were coming there to shoot a van's photo shoot of all the snowboard team at my, I have a cabin up in the, up in the San Bernardino mountains. It's a little yeah. government cabin. I let van, the van snowboard team use it in like 2005 or six or something like that. They needed like a place to sh photograph the, the snowboard team for a van's catalog, like clothing and boot catalog. Mm. So they just need to like, post up and shoot photos. And they wanted to use like, wild animals, trained animals for these weird portraits for the snowboard team. Well, it turns out the guy they hired lived 10 minutes away from the house that I had, the cabin up in the mountains. So they used my place and it was local. So I got to know the trainer pretty good because he had to come to my house to assess when he brought it. He was bringing grizzly bears, African lions, mountain lions, and a number of other small animals that could rip your face off, right, to a whole snowboard team. And uh, I said to Vans, you can use my house, <laughs> but you need to give me five minutes with the grizzly bear and the photographer. I called up Sturt and said, Dan, I got five minutes with a completely trained grizzly bear. We need to shoot a photo. Wow. And, I'm there. And, uh, and then the rest is history, but there's something else to do with that that I'm not going to tell you. Okay. But it was Dan's idea. Dan's okay. genius of going, hey, take your video camera, look down at it like, and he didn't prep me on this. When he came to shoot the portrait and the animal trainer said, okay, in a couple of minutes when everyone's taking a break, tell me what you need me to do. You've got your five minutes because he's being paid, right? Like to do that. And, uh, and so Dan had an idea, something, what's he going to do with you right now? I'm like, I'm here. There's a grizzly in a cage right there and Dan's there and the trainer's there and everyone else is eating lunch around the other side of the cabin. Like, what's Dan going to have me do? Is he going to have me grab it, get on its back? Like, seriously, this is a trained animal, but it's, gnarly like it's a 10 foot grizzly yeah oh, nine foot grizzly 10 foot pushing it 10, 10 um, foot wingspan big, <laughs> big. When something like that stands over you it's it feels like a wave over your head and it's six foot behind you the animal was standing six foot behind me so that it looked like it was over my shoulder it had to be that close what yeah. dan said was he said okay come here stand there you'll kill me anyway I won't tell the secret. He told me to stand there and he said, I'm going to shoot two pictures of you. You're going to walk over there. I'm going to shoot two pictures of you. And, 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 and the, the, the second one, you're going to run at me. The first one, I'm going to take a picture. The second one, you're going to run at me when I tell you to. All right? You know, and, and then the, the next bit, it's like, make sure you do what I say or you're going to get killed. Right? Because I don't know what he's doing, but he yeah. wants me to look more natural. He said, go over there, take your camera, and look down at the camera like you're looking at footage. And when I tell you to run at me, run at me. Don't lift your head up the whole time. Don't look at me. So I looked down the whole time, and the train was getting the grizzly bear closer and closer and closer to me. Right? So I don't even know where it is. I can hear it, like, huffing behind me. Damn. And uh, the train was using things, techniques to get it closer and closer, and then pulling it back and closer and closer and pulling it back so it doesn't just go, who's this? Grab the dude. And, and that's what we did. So what he did is he shot the photo and then he shouted, now run at me. So I didn't listen, didn't lift my head up and just ran straight out and thinking, if I get to him, I can run way faster than he can. I know which way to go because I were in my head. I'm like, I know how to run away from this animal right now and have him grab someone else and not me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm running, I'm running right down. I just thought, there's another way if I run full speed and I'm 30 yards away from him that he can outrun me. And within those 30 yards, I think I can get to him before the bear will be on me. Maybe. Maybe. Right. Anyway, so 
but that's what we did. We shot the photo. But the idea was the grizzly bear was looking at the footage that I just filmed, right? And then, uh, and then I ran off, something like that. I got to look so that no, photo. That Dan brought, brings a lot to anyone he works with, like, you know, to, to any mag he worked with, he brought this, like, level of, like, oh, just yeah. photography, you know, he, and wherever it's gone and any of those bodies of work that have gone places that have been him um, have been exceptional. And so when we start shooting photos for bands, he's one of the reasons why it worked, hmm. too, because of his creative eye, like, his imagery stood out as well. Yeah, and the drive that he has. I mean, I think in some he ways brought, he, he brought the drive to a lot of photographers to go the extra step. Yeah. Well, he did it for, 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 for me. He did it with his psychological freaking breakdowns of what we were doing, where we were going to be at in 10 years, what oh. we were going to feel. And we should probably think about that now. Oh. And I brought that to the table very early on, like rubber gloves at the skate scene. Rubber gloves, like 911, already dialed, just ready to push. You Fuck. know, a lot of emergency training so that if you knew, you'd know that you could trust him more than other people. A lot of other photographers who had no training. Right. That made me want to jump off a building. It made me want to jump between skyscrapers. It made me want to do the gnarliest things I could physically do with them. Yeah. And I tried to do it. And I, 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 I wish that I had a couple of goes to do some of them again, like some periods of my skating just to clean them up, clean myself up for six months and do that one thing I should have done that I never got around to with them. There's a, there's a few of those that are in my closet that I'll just die with and that's fine, Yeah, you know? But I did feel like that with Dan. I felt like I got the best guy in the world, right? If that's not a catalyst to you want to do the best skating you could ever do, I don't know what it is, you know? Because I knew why he was shooting it for the same creative reasons. He wanted to see gnarly shit go down. Yeah. He likes, he still skates now. Dan loves skateboarding. So yeah. all of that time, he loves skateboarding. Right? That's cool. And so for me to have a guy like that, I've shot a lot of pictures with. I just feel so fortunate. You he can't won. top the, the story. I mean, you might be able to, but for me, the fucking sniping a trans world photo shoot and sending the photo of Danny to Thrasher to beat trans world at their own photo shoot. I'm yeah. just like, how could you not applaud that as a, a NorCal guy? You know, if you pull back and go, I'm in skate media. How can you still not applaud it? <laughs> yeah. Because although that might be your work and it might have slided, slided you, which is, upsetting or somebody else put the effort into permitting and paying right. and live and yeah. then got that can't you know some of that juice juice delivered or removed or or put in it put in an envelope and mailed a pressure or whatever yeah. it was um that's fun for me like the guys that that he's shooting um i've never heard anyone go oh i, was, I never wish he hadn't done that I'm right. glad that he's there. I'll bet most of them said and went, dang, now I have that picture to document it as well. And it was on yeah. the top of the map. Right. Right? You know? I love that about Dan, that, that kind of keep you guessing kind of thing, you know? Um, and I took a lot of that. I was influenced by that. I'm still mm -hmm. influenced by that. Yeah, it was, yeah, he sent the photos, at least to Thrasher, the ones were print, and on the back it said, when you're done, send it to Jason Jesse. So Jason has like the original prints of a lot of the shit he shot. It's insane. Yeah. Like yeah. all that flip stuff you like you and Arto is like a lot of cool yeah. shit. Yeah, I've seen it's been bounced around. Like he sent me a lot directly uh, and right. extra bits and things like that directly yeah. of like all a ton of stuff. You know? Yeah. Like it's you know, so I, cool. I have, I have some stuff too. I've given a I've given a you know, a few of them away. And then I found some of them too on floors in places in where houses that they shouldn't be. Oh, weird. Like, like just when stuff's been being thrown away or been kicked to the curb, mm. I've, a few things have popped up and they've been stirred in the juice. You know, God, hold on weird shit. You know, and then Jake used to send me some, you know, randomly, like it would be a print or whatever, he'd send it. And he sent me some stuff prints down with me before that had been sent to Thrasher. That have then been sent down and vice versa like they've gone around a little bit mm -hmm. um, you know but um but one i didn't get 
and I don't have, I don't think, is, uh, is juggling the grenades. Yeah. Yeah, the Sodi uh, cover, right? Yeah. yeah, I have the pin photo. So at the end of the interview, there was a photo just at Sturchuk, just of the pin, a pin, not in the grenade. Yeah. The last page of the interview. I have that. Jake sent me that. You know, sent that to me. There's also the, the print at Thrasher that uh, um, was sent up for my interview that was uh, 180 Nose Brand on Wilshire. All right. Ed Templeton photographed it. And oh. I sent just that one negative to Sturt and he printed it and sent it directly to Thrasher. So I never, I don't have the print. I have a shitty print that Ed made. Like, uh-huh. if he didn't try to make a good print, he just printed it and out. So we'd have a copy to see what it, the scan would look like. And so I had that, and Sturt printed it, which he would never usually do, right? He printed it and sent it right up. So I wish I had that one, because it right. was an Ed photo. Sturt, Sturt printed it in the dark room. That's probably the only the one that I wish I had. Some of the later ones I have, you know, all the covers of the night. Yeah. Was that Dan's idea, the grenade one? No, that was that was Thrasher for the interview, and that was that was the, again half of those. I some of them were were, were were a combination of ideas I'd had, or a combination of ideas he'd had. Huh. You know, for some of those like weird portrait photos and shit like that that he would do. Um, but 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 almost always Daniel, you know. And then we'd use it, and whatever it was, we'd take that as an angle and twist it with the product, you know, and make it work. Yeah. Um, but there was some other. Yeah, he was amazing. But the grenades, the idea was, you know. Keep pulling the pins out. Eventually, one's going to blow up in your face. Yeah, it was cool. I oh, remember yeah. when they were laying out. I was like, "Oh, that's sick." Yeah, that was that was the idea. Yeah, he's amazing. The way that he did that and the way that he set that photograph up too. He makes such an effort with some of his photographs. He's like so freaking well thought out with them. When I uh, I put a little feeler out on my Instagram feed that I was going to be talking to you, and like a bunch of people wanted uh, a. To you to talk about Luke McCurdy. They want a good. Oh, Luke. okay. Yeah. Um, Luke is a, a, a good friend of mine since I was a younger kid. And um, he was an incredible skateboarder, one of the most well rounded skaters you'll ever meet. Um, and has been, is that he's a dude that could have been professional. If people want me to talk about Luke, that's it. He, was, he had everything to be able to. Be a professional skateboarder. He would prefer to be to enjoy the skateboarding and push himself without the demands of being sponsored or being a pro as uh-huh. much. Like I don't know if he's okay with me saying that, you know. But like, so he can do stuff like on a board, like superhuman. He can do any very, very, very well rounded. He's uh-huh. the guy he can do, he can do egg plants on vert with no pads, and at the same time would be the guy that can do any technical ledge trick if he put his mind to it. Right, you know. And, uh, very, very, very talented. But he lives in Texas and uh, still skates a bunch. And I used to live with him in Huntington Beach when I was growing up. And he moved from England. He's from the south coast of England, from a place called Rotting Dean. And, uh, and he lives in Austin, Texas right now with his wife and kids and still skates all the time. And um, yeah, the, 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 the Texas scene out there, I think when they, see them, when they see him skate, they go, oh, okay, yeah, he's really good. He's really fucking good. That's me. Very, very, very talented skater that no one really or not a lot of people are know of. Hmm. You know, um, yeah. Like on our King of the Road that we went on for Thrasher many, many years ago, he was our team manager. Oh, really? Our team manager on King of the Road for Thrasher. Ah. And 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 also he did more tricks in the book than I did. He did, did he? more tricks. Like all of us probably on the trip. That's how good he is. Like there was a. Okay, someone needs to do a backside heel flip wall, right? Okay, Luke, you got it. <laughs> Bang, you got it. Right, wow. like that. Yeah, someone needs to do an eggplant revert. I'm sure he can do it. Try it, Luke. Like, that's who Luke is. Very talented. Anything he picks up, he does it well. Yeah. 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 Wow. I'm very um, stable, very stable person. One of those people that you've known, like, most of your life that still skates, that is the consistency to who they are that you appreciate. Right, like he, he's that he's a very fucking solid person. And then, what about Sodi? Um, that's the year two thousand. Was that like, a, yeah, a huge deal? Obviously, a game changer. Like something you look back at as like you can always like take pride in. Like 
the mag gave you this award felper handed it to you there was like what was some of the things you remember of it i know it's 20 years ago this year so it's been a minute but like yeah what a fucking well, deal huh i remember where the mag was at that time i remember looking through thrashing mags and and um and 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 seeing that like skating was changing skating was changing and a lot of that change wasn't all happening in san francisco a lot, a lot of that to just be open and speak about the fucking world as it is it wasn't a lot of that progression a lot of it a lot of it was happening then step two not all these skaters but we had a lot of that happening down in southern california right and that period of skating like it was all changing videos were changing people were starting to make videos outside of southern california we were starting to film in Barcelona. We were starting to film in Paris. We were starting to film across cities in the U.S. We were starting to film in Phoenix more, Las Vegas. Prior to that, they were like day trips for SoCal skate teams, right? They weren't really, unless you were from there, like a Colby car or something. Those videos weren't as diverse, you know? And so when that was starting to happen and like I moved to SoCal and you had guys like Reynolds and a bunch of us moving from all different parts of the world to SoCal, Thrasher didn't have a lot of photographers down in SoCal quick enough to get on it, right? To cover everyone. They had photographers, but right. not enough to cover from LA down to San Diego. You had Jamie Thomas going bonkers down in San Diego, right? And you had Andrew and I like in hate in Huntington Beach kind of area. And then you had all the LA crew, Costin and all that. That's a lot of guys to cover on the weekend. Yeah. Right? Thrasher was hiring new photographers and like around that time, like I always loved the mag. I was the fresher hoodie kid, right? Like I had a yellow one, a blue one, and uh, and where I'm from was a little more, m m more. I related more to the fresher mentality than I did the other mags, right? And I wanted to see thrash to be thrasher, but I felt like some of the, some of the you know the mag could get better. And when they started hiring younger photographers, the kids started getting better. Mm. Right, and when that started to happen, I started to shoot more for Thrasher because there was Thrasher photographers around. Right, so Burnett moved from Colorado. All of a sudden, we had a San Diego photographer that shot sequences that was ready to go, 24 hours a day to go anywhere to get the trick. Right, so that was the game changer. Like yeah. I, I, so I wanted to do a Thrasher interview. Let's do a fucking Thrasher interview. Let's do a gnarly cover. Let's do a crazy interview. So my first Thrasher interview was that, was like, shit, I have a chance to do a Thrasher interview right now, and like I can get Sturt to shoot the stills, and I can get Burnett to shoot the sequences, right? And so that's what we did, and like some of those, like those in, that, the, the mag at that time changed. The mag changed, you know, with all of the, all of the Warner content, like the Warner Avenue dudes, Eric Ellington, Greco, all this, what they were doing, what we were all doing, what right. Jamie was doing. In San Diego, what the girl guys were doing in LA, and what we were doing in Huntington Beach, Orange County area, right? Like that was a freaking melting pot in the mags in the nineties, and that's just like, and covered all of that. And um, but like I felt like I was an honor to get the first interview in the mag, and then when during the same year I had an interview and the scare of the year thing, right? But I think my interview came out first. I can't remember because those were different times, like the. The interview would come out a year before you won Skate of the Year or some shit, right? Like, they yeah. Didn't, you win Skate of the Year and then you had three months to do, a, you know, a Skate of the Year interview. Yeah. You actually had a lot longer. Yeah. I remember. Because I was one of the first people to do the Skate of the Year interviews. You huh. know what I mean? Like, I would cap after you'd won it. Yeah. Because I had, I had a Skate of the Year interview after my first Thrasher interview. So I was just fucking honored. I mean, but when Jay called me, honestly, that's, like, at the time, I just wanted to rip. I wanted the fire rockets, set fires, right? But I wanted them all to work, right? Like meaning tricks and stuff like that and the shit that we were doing. Um, so when, but when Jake called me, like I was talking to Jake and I didn't know Jake at the time, right? Like I was just, I didn't know him that well. I was probably 20 years old or something like that. And so I was just getting to know Jake. I went up for my Thrasher interview and then shot the portrait in the basement below with Luke Ogden, right? Or in his house, maybe. In his house in the basement. I can't remember because it was in a basement. Don't remember what was above it. But he <laughs> built a little thing in his basement to shoot the portrait and stuff in. Yeah. Because I said I wanted it to look like a padded cell, you know? Oh, Some right. Yeah. But I want it to look like somebody's got their head down in a padded cell and they're just going to go nuts on their board when you turn the page. 
it wasn't, it wasn't anything. And uh, so I started to talk to Jake a little bit then. Started to get to know him a little bit when I was up in SF alone. And that was kind of some of the first times I like, spent time with him where there was no one from the magazine or no other skaters around. Or, and, um, you know, so I talked to him a little bit. So when he called me after to tell me I'd won Skater of the Year, like, I'd already spoken to him a couple of times since then, right? So I knew him a little bit better, but I didn't know him that well. But I, like, I just felt like I wanted to do the same thing that I was trying to do in the mag, which is just explode stuff. And, you know, given the opportunity, push myself as far as I can physically go. And if somebody like Jake Phelps and Thrasher Magazine says that I can do it, I can do it. And so that's what it, it meant, you know? Um, I was just getting to know Jake. Like, just getting to know him as, like, a real person when he called me up and told me I'd won Skate of the Year. So oh. my response was just straight, straight up the same as what I was trying to push through the mags. Is like, okay, you're going to give me the opportunity to freaking hammer it down. I'll go to town for you. I will put it all on the line from here on out. That's what it meant, you know? Oh, and I try to hold that. I really do. Like, I mm. try to never, ever take the easy route with it, with my skating. That's why I get hurt. You know, like I, I'm, I'm still skating now. I've been skating since I was 13 years old with that same mentality. I mean, you saw Jake before he passed. Like he had 450 stitches across his body or something like that. You know, 55 surgeries and walked in front of cars a million times. And yeah, he outdid he Evil Knievel, I think. Yeah, but that's what it meant to me, Greg. Like truly, that's what it meant to me. It meant I, I had a dream of like being a skater as a little fucking kid. And and when when I was when Jake called me and said that is a validation. It's a the editor of the magazine that I bow down to, you know, that I would do anything to be in. A lifestyle that I fucking love and want to live and just will do anything it takes to just do that, pursue that, because it's it's in my heart, right, to do it. Yeah. It did mean a lot, you know, especially especially me being pro being like, I'm a pretty confident person, generally. You know, honest, like, I'm generally a, a upbeat. I wake up in the morning, and, I, and I, if I'm grumpy, it's just because I need to wake up. But usually, once I wake up, let's do this. Uh, I'm, that, I'm that guy in that. But um, that's your dream come true, right? Yeah. Then you can't deny it. Then you go, the editor, like, has made me scared of the year. If I pretend I still suck, then that's negative. No, like he wants fire. Let's bring it, you know. And that—that's what it was, you know. And, and I don't know. I think that was something I had in common with Jake. I understood that when you won Skate of the Year, it didn't mean it was a medal. It meant you had work to do. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I don't mean in in a in a really serious manner, you know. Like I didn't mean it like that. I meant like you now need to show us what you can do right and everybody yeah. is, is there you know supporting it you know that's kind of what i, I like when i see guys win skate of the year i want to see them succeed you right know, i want to see the of the year win it and then a year later go look he's better than he was the year before exactly like, right? right and that's how it should be yeah years you know, you're, reach out, right? like people reach out like kids sponsor me videos and stuff like that and they send you a video and they say am i good to be sponsored that generic thing the response is always going to be if you're not 10 years ahead of what you're seeing right now, like you're not hitting that level. Hmm. That's what I want to see. Jake wanted to see that every day. Yeah. Right. Like that fire of that. Totally. And, and he did that for me, you know, truly. And the fact that he liked Dan Sturt, like he liked Sturt, like he liked the way that Sturt did it and he thought it was rad and, and he valued his, his talents and he, and he, and, he, and that like, that supportive side of it, fucking huge. Got me way fired up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nah. Yeah, I miss the old man. I see you got his picture up on the wall behind you. I got the same oh, wow. photo on my hoodie today. Yep, it's, Hunter's Point yeah. uh, Vert Ramp, uh, Bryce Knight's photo. Layback, yeah. sick. Yeah, I miss the old man a lot, especially we talked earlier about like just during these crazy times, it would be so yeah. interesting to see what <laughs> the old man would say or do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were laughing. We're like, 
Is is he behind the COVID nineteen? Like, is it Jake just fucking yeah. torturing us with fires and everything? Like, what the fuck? Yeah, I think he'd see it for what it was. You know, yeah. I, I, like deep down, I think he'd see it for what it was. And that, and he's watching this right now. You know, he is. He's right there. Like, where else is he going to be? Where else are you going to do right now, man? I don't know. But yeah, that does get on you, doesn't it? You want go on positivity from it, but we got it. Like, look at. You know, all, all the dudes ripping it up right now, how much they love Jake, that younger generation, too. Yeah, right? it's really cool. Yeah, Rowan and fucking Grant and Figgy yeah. and all these dudes that would just go on every skate rock trip and just led Jake's party anthem and, and skate anthem, really, you know. But uh, it was just the whole lifestyle that they, they all kind of gravitated towards and... uh Hopefully, yeah, it keeps it. All those dudes keep it going. I, I talk to Ronnie a lot, and just the mentality you can tell different people that were close with Jake and have a little chunk of them still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's important. Pass that along, pass the energy on. <clears throat> yeah, you know, talk. The, few, the kids are going to decide, aren't they, what comes next? Yeah, and they, and they should. You yeah, know? they have to. Um, yeah. talk about the your Vans video part. You, uh, it was really important. You and I talked a bunch leading into it, getting some of Jake involved in it. Uh, you tributed the part to him. Um, I haven't really got to speak to you too much since then. No. Um, but uh, yeah, could you share a little bit of that? Um, well, like it, it was basically Jake had passed and you were putting out a video part around that. What it, what it was is it was it was 2019, the end of 2019, and I, I felt physically good. Started to film. We finished. I finished a minute long video part just a little bit before I started to film. I felt really good. Like I was stoked on skate and enjoying it. And I, and I said to Vance, "Hey, I'm filming. I've filmed some stuff. If you want to film some, let's do it." And they thought it'd be a good idea to do some. Jamie did it. Vance, Jamie Hart to yeah. do some from 20 years riding because 2020 would be me. Sorry, 2019 would have been me, 20 years me riding for Vance. So Vance had these plans to like do some 20 year things for, for myself, right? As an athlete for him. So we just thought, well, let's just might as well rope it in the same thing. I'll just film a video part for the 20 year thing. And then we said, well, you know, there's other dudes filming. Do you want to film with some other dudes? I'm like, well, it'd be weird if it's a big video and it's a 20 year thing because then it's about. It's not about me, just me. It's just about me. It should just be a single video part. I said, let's just put out a video with a few dudes and not attach it to the 20 year, but put it out at the same time, right? With dudes that I think have similar energy. So the video feels like the same video all the way through. Yeah. Right? Like same kind of skater. Like we, you know, I don't know. I know. And that was the idea. So the idea of putting, you know, well, I, I looked at Ronnie and went, Ronnie's, Ronnie is so like everyone. He's been everyone's fan, fan. Everyone's been a fan of Ronnie Sandoval since he was like a little kid, and everyone wanted to see him blossom into the skater that he's now. right now. Uh, I wanted the opportunity to go on skate trips and see a video part of him come together and be there and be involved in that because I wanted to see it. You know what I mean? I wanted yeah. to help that. Can that happen? That can happen right now if like if we make it. Let's make that happen because Ronnie Sandoval is one of the best skaters that you hadn't seen skate that. That, that much of, uh -huh. right? Like, and push himself like that. So yeah, Ronnie's great. Perfect. Like, I love Ronnie. I've traveled with Ronnie. Like I got on well with Ronnie. I like skating with Ronnie. Good and kid. and and the right kind of focused on skating, right? Like Pedro, you go skate. Doesn't matter if there's a beer going. Doesn't matter. It's not the point. The trick needs the hammers go down, right? Let's light this thing up. Uh, so I just thought, we do it like that. That's going to be great. Let's go on trips. Like Ronnie skates more tranny DIY ish. Pedro's bigger tranny, and I'm more like street kind of crossover and a bit of that generally. Yeah. So what if we go to the same spots? What's going to happen? What will it look like? So that's what we did. I thought let's kick that off with a trip to England, Frasher, with Burnett and Jake, so that we get like the DNA of like Jeff, Pedro, and Ronnie in the UK where I'm from at the start of the video and then we'll end it in the US. You know, so we'll start it there and then we'll do another trip at the end to package it together. Helps with everybody's travel and all that shit. So that's what we did. So the I when it got two thirds of the way through the video and Jake passed, right? 
We're like, fuck, there's loads of footage, right? It's the tricks that we have with like Pedro, me, the Jake's there as well, all, all of them. And he was supposed to be in the video anyway. That's why we brought him on the trip, right? right? Because I wanted to show him that like, hey, I want to go on a trip with you. That's how, for like my Vans thing, whatever that we want. I want to go on a trip with you, Jake, right? And, uh, and I knew he loved Pedro and I knew he loved Ronnie. And then thought that's look at that DNA for the start of the video. Everyone will get juiced up, and then everyone can go wherever they want for nine months. Mm. And when it finished the video, the energy's there all the way through from that one trip. And then Jake passed, and Rain was passed, and I had footage of Ben who was out skating me when I was in London and stuff. And so Fuck. it could easily have gone. Fuck, it's a negative. Don't put the video out. Change it. You know, but that's not the way to do it. You know, so we have to finish the job like that, which is. Kind of rough. Totally you know? rough. I was proud that we were able to finish it off with those kind of conditions, you know, just rough few months. I mean, anyone anyone listening to this, think about it. Go to your local skate park and push yourself to your limit for the next three months after, you know, two of your friends have just passed really awful. Like, try to stay focused every day right away when you're on deadline like that. And uh, that was what I was proud of, that we didn't give in, that we finish the video how we were supposed to do and yeah had ripped in it like destroyed it like he should have done like he would have done if jake was there mm. and so did Ronnie, right yeah so that's what we were able to do so that's why it's 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 for jake it's not it's not even a dedication for me to jake it's for jake that's jake's video we made during that period of time the energy of jake the yeah. name of the video take it back was that you know like you're not having our skate skateboarding you know it's ours and, uh, so that you know that was but it was a positive it was just a rough time for that shit to happen while we we're filming and you know and uh but but in a nutshell it, it we finished the video you know and i enjoyed it and i didn't get hurt until the last slam i got fucked up didn't oh, skate man. because of all of my internal chest like um bruising and like pain the, i had the wally um, board slide yeah i just fell on my body really fucking hard yeah inside and it hurt me i'd lift my arm up couldn't breathe couldn't take a full breath so once i mean once i got through that like you look and you go fuck like i finished the video my friends are in it two of them are freaking dead it's supposed to be a positive thing we turned it into a positive thing what do i do now my body hurts i've just finished another video you know and what you know you have to re-energize again right if you want to do another video like that the next day you know, and, and so I took a little bit of a breather after that video as far as like just enjoying my skating, still filming stuff, but enjoying it and not. And then recently I've been, you know, starting to film quite a bit with, with Pedro for this little video we're going to put out in the, the end of September. Um, but it's going to be a short video with, with Pedro and a little bit of other stuff in there. Um, but that we've been, so I've been working on that. Nice. Just, you know, a couple of weeks of Film, film some more tricks for that and then we'll put that out and, uh, and then we have some secrets in that video and some other stuff coming after that um, I like it. I'm just waiting, trying to make the make the best of this crazy time right now I'm putting, putting that negative energy that's out in the world um, you know leveling it out trying to level it out wherever I go trying to kill people with kindness trying to kill you know, negativity with, with with kindness, trying to kill it all with that, you know, and if someone doesn't want to drop in, then, then we drop in for them. All right. So that's where, where, where I'm at, you know, really, Greg, and I'm stoked. I'm enjoying my skating. You know, Sprinkle a little wisdom on your toast. <clears throat> oh, try. Yeah. yeah. Would, um, you, would you ever go back for that wa uh, Wally board slide, or is that spot yeah. dead to you after oh, something like that? I was like, this first go that I tried to make, oh. you know what I mean? Like I was warming up and just like, that was the first one I almost made. So I would, but I don't go back. Occasionally I do. Yeah, but I was wondering. I don't go back when I don't care and just go, fuck it, I'll go and do that. And it's three months later, I'm like, I'm gonna try that again. But I don't intentionally go, shit, didn't get it. I'm gonna work on it and go back again. A lot of dudes do. I'm like an energy guy, right? Mm -hmm. Like I look at the spot and I go, yeah, the light's good today. And my body feels like not too warm. Fuck it, and I just drop in and try. Yeah, you know, premeditated side of it's there, but it's also, you know, it's also fucking, um, you know, a switch. 
Okay. Out of all the insanity you've been through, <clears throat> is there one moment that sticks out to you that you were most scared or like, this is fucking, yeah. you know, like some crazy ass situation? Uh, like you just knew it's pending? Yeah. Uh, or, or like a spot that you were like, I'm going to try this, but fuck, I don't know if I got it. Twice I've gone to places with stir that I've turned down. Oh. One, one of them was I wanted to do a roof gap in the night in the rain. Right, so I wanted to see water flying with, uh, you know, the flash reflecting off all the little droplets of water coming off your board upside down, like kind of thing. Okay. I thought, Dude, like, fuck, that's gnarly. Do it in the rain, roof gap, in the night. So you can't see anything. It's wet, and you're going across your roof. I never got to that. I went to do it, went in to actually do the spot, and realized that I needed to check myself. Seriously, I just had to go... You need to go home. You need to go home right now. You need to go home. You're going to fall off the roof and you just ride at it. <laughs> I like to tell Dan, like, Dan, I'm going home. I'm really sorry you came up in the winter to, you know, Buena Park in the middle of the winter in the rain to shoot a photo of me in the, in the middle of the night, early hours of the morning or something. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep moving this. Hi, you're all good. Yeah, good. Um, that's the only time that I remember. And, you know, one of the rail that, like, was something to do with, I felt like it was going to stick, you know? And I couldn't get out of my head that the rail was going to stick. And it's a rail I'd skated before. Um, that was the only other time with Dan that I just pretty much said no. We're just benign. But a couple of times, you have to sometimes with certain things, you know, you don't feel it that day. But I know what you're saying, though. That's a little yeah. Well, in, in your mind, are you kind of scared to say no to Sturt as well? Like it, him being there, are you like, ah, oh, this guy's going to fuck with yeah, me? Got confidence. Once you call Dan and go, Dan's going to be there. I asked him to be there at 10 a.m., which means he'll show up at 6 a.m. <laughs> right? And be ready from the That's like my Jake. House, not at the spot at 6 a.m. Right? So, like, so Dan was part of the process. Once the call to Dan was made, then the preparations for delivering, <laughs> like flying down, whatever it was, so he could push a button and capture it, was already was already set. So Dan was confident, was confident. Like it was helpful to know that Dan was there because I also knew that if I flipped upside down and fell down the hole, right, landed on my head upside down, I want him there more than anybody else that I know. That He's got your back. Yeah, he 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 would handle it. Right? He would handle it, but and but more importantly too, he would also capture it as well as handling it. If he survived, he'd probably get the shot somehow, right? Because like so, that's what I, that's the confidence with Dan of like, and uh, he runs all over the place as well. Like when he's shooting, he's running up and down the stairs. You've probably seen it in some of the videos of me where you can see Dan. He's running all over the place. He's, he's, he, go, he stands in funny spots where you can hit him really easy, you know, or intentionally puts things in places where if you fall where you're likely to fall, you're going to land on that, right? So he, he, he mod, he, he's very, uh, very well thought out. It's kind of strategic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Sick, dude. Um, skate shops. We like to uh, give props to skate shops here because – to me, they're super important to our culture and, uh, you know, helping kids develop as what we were drawn to as opposed to, like, this other thing necessarily. Um, what can you say about skate shops? Have you had, like, a special experience or a favorite one that you've been on tour that they took you to their local spot or barbecue, you know, whatever it may be? Greg, like over the years, right? Like we all know the importance of the skate shop, that first place for a kid to see the culture and like be accepted. Come in, have a look, check these out. What do you need, man? Have you ever seen this video? Like, did you know that people skate like this? That kind of thing. That's how important they are. Like, super important. Um, and you know, I have a lot of friends who own, right? Like in Long Beach, we have Long Beach Skate, which has just expanded their door. They do a lot of the local skate scene. They do loads of skate jams, and they bring the community together like Tim, right? So he does a lot and he's doing a, a, a real lot right now with, you know, what's going on in these troubling times kind of thing. So he's bringing a lot of people together and helping support the community through skateboarding. 
and through his skate shop. He does a great job. You know, there's a ton of them. Like the, the city that I grew up in, Lost Art, is the local skate shop. Oh um, yeah. You know, useless wooden toys. You know, and and, and they without that shop, that city skate scene wouldn't be what it is. They wouldn't be there. Right, like the catalyst for all the skate events that happen in the city, the ones that host it, but a lot of times are the ones that manage the, the teams that come through their cities. And, uh, you know, so that's how important they are in places like that, too. Like in the northwest coast of England, if that shop doesn't exist. How's the kid going to know what's a good skateboard? Their skateboarding uh, school system. They're our education. They're, they're there yeah. to tell you what's right and wrong, what's good, don't be a kook, all that yeah. shit. Yeah. yeah. They're an open door to all of the product, too, which I think is what sets skating aside. Like, our gear is cool. Like, the stuff we make, like skateboards in itself, is really colorful, right? They're rad products. And skate shops in themselves, like, you can go in and watch a video in a shop. Like, not many shops you go in, you can sit there, be welcomed in to watch a garden show in the local garden store. No. You know? And, like, that's the difference between the skate shop is it's a lot more inviting. It's a lot more friendly and personal. You hope it is. They're not all like that, right? But, um, but the ones that are good, Cowtown in Phoenix. Yeah. Right? Laura long. and Trent. They do things on the side for the community and, the, and their customers. Absolutely. Those are the ones that difference. Yeah, you know, and those are the ones that resonate to me. You know, the big box retailers are important too, but that's what they are. That's their place. Everyone plays a role, and the, and the, the core skate shops are the ones that try to always have the hottest stuff that's coming out of skate. Um, you know, they they are different. They are not your average skate shop. You know, and those are the ones that are very important. But there's also you know it's important for that middle of the ground one too. That once a kid started skating, he's going that. You know, um, maybe he doesn't know where his local skate shop is, and he only has a big sporting goods within 45 minutes of his house, right? right at times, like, but those skate shops bring those scenes to local skate parks and things like that. They do so much, um, you know. So I don't know. Can't say enough about that, though, can you? Really? No, I've been stepping my game up because when this COVID thing hit, I realized like those guys needed help you know like they were how they were i saw their struggles like curbside pickups all this shit like our shops what, how are we gonna pull this so i was like dude i don't really support the shops yeah, the way it, i should so we tried to send them extra boards and stuff like that when they place orders you know we right. tried to, as much as we can we understand that like a couple of extra boards here and there or anything we can do to help because we're a small business too in the same boat exactly right? Yeah, like some of what we do, like um, like my skateboard company's in like the second season of getting the ball rolling, right? So it's affected by you know a close down of manufacturing and all of that stuff. Right, getting get the woods hard right now. Each other out, and do what we can to get through those things, right? So it's a two way street with it. Um, but the skate shops and the things that some of the skate companies are doing for the skate shops and supporting them right now is nice to see. Very. And classic shop in Reno, they do a great job. Yeah, too, yeah, right? like um, sick you know, one. So. Yeah, Lotties yeah. has been doing yeah. a lot of cool stuff with like they did that skate shop program where they made graphics for all the the different shops yeah. and they made a shirt series. I'm down yeah. for all that stuff. I like it a lot. Yeah, we, did, we did that at Vans with their custom culture thing too. Right? So yeah, all, I got the right? Grosso <laughs> ones. That was cool. Yeah, yeah. We did a bunch of skate shops, you know, uh -huh. and all the small businesses that were affected heavily by. You know the lockdown and the close of the manufacturer, yeah. I mean, um, which is awesome, awesome to do. You know, and I think mm. we can do that. Yeah, five one zero right here. They they did a big vans thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, big love to the skate shops. Um, we're winding out. I just got a few more things I want to touch base real quick. If you yeah. got this time, uh, yeah. one is. Um, the skate rock trip you and i went on you actually fucking put one under your belt and jumped in the van from uh, i think it was was that one detroit to new orleans yeah uh, right detroit to new orleans detroit i think to to new orleans was yeah. the last town well that was a big whirlwind uh, right i think it was bed bugs the first night uh, <laughs> the very first night yeah bed bugs. 
very first night in the hotel. It was. It was <laughs> it's, oh, man, that was no, an insane it's, one. Herman's Hall well, was the highlight. You, you know what you're getting into when you go on that, let's just say that. Yeah, did right? you? Did you did you think it was under or over what you expected it would be? It was anything goes. I, I I was expecting everything I saw, but I was also expecting something that I hadn't ever seen happen at any moment throughout the whole time. <laughs> yeah. You know, if somebody had said that a burning car fell off the roof the day before, then it probably did. Yeah. On skateboard, you know. Insanity. <laughs> oh man. Um, mayhem. <laughs> total mayhem uh also um i want to put you to thinking on this might be tough but i wonder if you were t to put together a best of jeff roley video part all the things you've ever filmed do you in your mind know what the ender would be oh the last trick yeah but that that sorry point the pen i was gonna say it was um that's subjective. But subjective to you. So what you're, you're saying is like the, the end is the best. So you want to know what I consider to be like the pinnacle? Or how right? you want to end your part to, to put the last memory in life. people's mind going away. Okay. Um, could be riding into the sunset or it could be the gnarliest thing. You don't know. What it will be is depends the music boom, like this and then you won't know. I said that very early on, is that when I'm done, up the mountains, you'll never see me again. Oh, okay. That's, that would be a cool way to do it, though, right? Or the or it fades to black and it just says dot 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 to be continued. And then it does, but then it has to continue. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to leave people hanging like that. That's a bummer. That's like a royal. It's got to end with something coming, right? Okay. So unless I then film one hammer. Oh. That never ever seen. Yeah. Because I knew. Let's say you give me twenty four hours right now, and uh -huh. that's it. And I have to put out the video part, and it's going to get judged by the world. Okay. And I need the highest scores for my video part ever. I would go ahead and probably do the thing that I hadn't done because I knew I was going to die. So I, I, between the two biggest gaps, the highest off the ground that I could possibly find. Heath Kerchart. Just do the fucking bobs or something like that. I was insane yeah, in that yeah, video yeah. part. Yeah, what? that's exactly it. That's yeah. exactly it. But okay. next is the best, as they say, right? So I don't know. You know, the, the the container thing that I did, I think, was the most dangerous thing that, 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 that like, I wouldn't want to do again. Everything else mentally I could, like, do again, but I wouldn't want to do that again. Right. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. So probably that, because I know what it felt like, and I was in the skin, and there was some things that weren't good. And I just skated it anyway, right? Like it was moving and stuff like that. Like when you're standing on top, the things are moving, and you can't see the ocean. I could just see the ocean, Fuck. right? Like I don't want to do that again because it was quite far, the gap, right? And so first go when you're like, I've got to go really fast to clear it. You're still like, I don't want to trip over my board. So I've got to go real fast, real smooth, and I can't break my foot to test it. Because there's a gap. So you know when you skate roof gaps, what's fucked up about them is you can't practice your run-up speed. You know when you ride towards stairs, a dude will, when he's going to ollie 15 stairs, which you've seen dudes ollie like massive stairs. Yeah. They ride towards it and go, okay, that's the speed I need. I got it. And then they back off and they know exactly where they need because they can see where they need to go. You can't do that on roof gaps because you can't go right to the edge of them standing up and project your body across them because you're standing on your board at that point. So you're standing up looking across it and you're 30 feet before you're taking off the end. So that, I wouldn't want to do that again, you know? But I would still wish that I'd done a bigger one. You know what I mean? You're always gonna. I probably got killed, but that's that's where my brain goes. I, I, like I'd love to, I'd love to look back on life and go, shit man, I had a blast, but I never like, you know, never, never stepped down from like the things that I wanted to achieve skating you know like I think anybody wants that peace of mind right like I'm good you know with that and uh so that's it I would I'm the dude that there's no last part first part first last the best like it, 
first the best the last whatever they call it um, uh. to me i think that every piece of the puzzle is just as important when it comes to skate videos and skateboarding i always felt like that Good the more point. you highlight it's like fine the last unless it's like the dude's part is it goes there i always i always felt like you know if you're in a video with other guys everyone gets the same you know like you're not making a video to highlight one guy yeah like blind video days you watch that and went oh oh they're everyone they're all gnarly they're yeah. all that good and you've never been hit like that before right yeah those are the videos i want to make right those are the videos where everybody's equal right everybody's equal all there's the way no through. ff and just because you can do a bigger handrail doesn't mean you get last part well that brings us to current current status uh you got the new board company this might be a two-headed question or it might be a one-headed question and it's up to you well i want i want to talk about the freedom to skate the boards that you're that you're doing but i also am wondering if you want to mention at all anything about flip or or any of that uh no let's just talk about what we're doing now okay now that's the before yeah um I'm stoked, Greg. Honestly, I mean, I, 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 you know, I get a chance to create skate graphics and things that I enjoy doing. I enjoy doing it. I love doing it. And, you know, I've been doing it most, most of my life to some degree, you know, different aspects of it, whether it's videos or skateboard graphics or, or, or whatever it might be. So it's been awesome just to be doing it without uh, creative hindrance and and with a, just an, an open blank piece of paper to c- come up with ideas that you know um, we can put through the board company so it's been fun I've been enjoying it you know I've been thinking about how to create video re- video production for the brand that like has its own point of difference same with creating graphics that have their own point of difference and, a, and an, an aesthetic and a brand that acts the way it wants to act so I've been setting a lot of up. It takes a long time to open up accounts globally with a skateboard brand. Um, I can't stress that enough that um, if you want to sell a skateboard over in, a, in, in Germany, right, or in Australia or in Japan or China or Canada, you have to open up those accounts. So I've been spending quite a bit of time slowly just looking at the different regions on how best to distribute and how best to set up my company. Right, but in the same breath, the creative side of making all the products been awesome. So I've been skating a bunch because of it. I'm riding boards and graphics that like I always wanted. You know what I mean? That I'm creating, and when they're finished, I'm I'm stoked on them, like hyped on them. I want want to ride the graphics because I like them. Um, So that's been super fun. And then just slowly piecing together a team and building the brand step by step each season, adding what we can handle. We're a small business during COVID. And I dropped my second season dropped like a week before the COVID lockdown. Ooh. Right. And then, and so you have the manufacturing drop of four months, you know, of like everything shuts down. So, um, but that being said, um, you know, the, 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 the graphics have been, received well people psyched on them the seller has been really good on them sick dude and I'm stoked on them. so people are responding well the customers are, are stoked on the boards and they're selling so i'm stoked on that Happy okay day. and then um is pedro you know, on the work, team we've been working on a video and and it's kind of pedro came out here about about three months ago from brazil right as the lockdown was happening and he just like quickly dipped out get out quick to go skate so that he can skate for a few months Mm. And so we came out and we just started skating and started filming and just decided we'd keep filming, right? And we had plans to put out a board. I've been talking to Pedro for a little while about doing like a guest board or a full, full board. And so we're launching kind of that first board now, but because of the COVID, it kind of got stretched out a little bit. Uh, okay. Right? Meaning we, we launched this board like a week ago, and that was a hand screen run of Made in USA screen boards. And then the full production was coming right behind that. There's a little bit of lapse in between the middle of that. So we wouldn't be having this conversation if we would seen things come out. So we'll let those things come out, right? But we've been working on the video and it comes out the end of September. Pedro's been fil- filming a bunch. And, uh, and we just want to make something that just shows like people skating and shows a little bit more of the 
less of a production and more of a we're just filming everything in the van, just filming everything that's going on, and let's let's see what it, what it looks like at the end of that. And so we're getting to that point where we're starting to piece that together and look at that. So I'll know a little bit more about where that's going tomorrow. Ah. <laughs> tomorrow, because I'm doing a bunch a review check of a bunch of the footage to see where we're at. Okay. So I'll answer your question a little bit more in a couple of days. But right now, it's a board on the brand, right? He has a board on the brand, and, and I'm, I'm honored that he was stoked to do it. Like, I've been a fan of Pedro, right? Like, when I, when I rode for Vulcan, I traveled with Pedro yeah. a lot. Yeah. Really good. How can you, you not know, be? As a young kid, I always related to the way that he skated. You oh, know, man. like, not me as a young kid, but when I watched him come up, I went, yeah, I like the way that he skates. You know, I like the fact that he just, every time he drops in, he just shocks you and your jaw drops down, right? So it's a, it's a homey thing as well, where like, hey, let's just skate and put out a video and go from there. And that's all it has to be. That's, that's what I'm trying to remind myself oh, cool. too creatively is, is take baby steps and enjoy every step of it, you know? And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. You know, so we have a video. So I've been filming a bunch like I said, since lockdown, so all that footage will be in this video. Video is called Free Dream, and there's going to be more than one part to it. Huh. Is there any yeah. other people you want to mention, or is it all a surprise? There's other people in the video, but I'm not mentioning them right now because it's coming out like a little bit. Right. That's the How cool. Video. Okay. When, when you click the stop button, I'll answer anything you want. Excellent. Right? But that's the fun of it. Right. And that's the, that's the part of it that I enjoy. Right finding riders that are good and finding yeah, like the building blocks a guy that maybe didn't have the support that they had before finding them the right house so that they can be everything they can be, you know and that takes time to do you know that takes time to do and and uh, and so those steps you know those steps are moving forward and in this video you'll see a little bit more more skating and video and more of what's happening and going on okay and each, you'll see more and more Right? Okay. That's how you, you want. That's what I want out of skate video. Just keep each season. Just keep keep me guessing, but keep me creating, but keep me on brand. Yeah, right? that's the out. thing. Yeah, but we do we do have, we do have riders, right? And, and they will be announced, right? So that's what I will say. Excellent, man. Looking forward to that. It's always good to have things to look forward to. I'll I'll tell you that. <laughs> On skating, right? Like when you find like dudes that rip, right? That like have all that, that talent that's there. I just want to see it come to fruition as a skate fan. And if I can help that by like, you know, the amount of video production that I've been involved with, right? Like amount of skate videos we've made, basically. You see, it works. Like it, it's, you know, curating a video part or making a video part is just documenting the stuff that you enjoy or that you like to do. And if you want some of it to be less for like less kind of pushed that's up to the skater sure right like half of his video car can be lazy and the other half can be hammers like you can't tell somebody how to skate with that but if you see talent and you see that if you pull the bits that everyone's already seen and put them together and they make something special like that's what i'm looking for in riders you know like guys and girls i'm looking for something within that that's special you know and, uh, and they're out there, you know, the talent's out there. And I think also there's a lot of, I don't know, maybe there's a lot of people and riders and people that might want to ride for a company to, to give them the opportunity to do something different. And from a creative standpoint, like I haven't set any, any fingers down, right? I can go any direction right now. I can go full steam ahead, right? Or I can just take baby steps. I think that's that. what we need, 100%. I, I like you know. 110%. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, MJ, there's a lot of guys that are kind of like in that same boat. They're like, I don't want to have to do this or that. I want to do this. And no one's going to tell me no, because yeah. I'm the guy of my deal. So yeah. you want to ride like this? Come on, let's go. Yeah, But I'm looking forward to doing more video because that's the stuff that you know I enjoy doing, like making video parts for them to get. But I'm looking forward to doing that for the board company. Big yeah. time. Oh, so right, like I've made videos for other, the other companies I was with before with Flip. I've made a ton of bands videos now, I think three or four video parts. Yeah. So I want to do a catalog for the board company, and that will make me, that will stoke me out. So that's a huge, like, getting me fired up is like, 
you've never made a board company video since those flip videos, right? For a board company. Right. So these, it's special. It means something to me. And I want to make sure that the video that we put out is fucking sick. Sick as fuck. Right? 110%. Full speed death all the way through with a smile. Right? Yeah, man. But just skating. Just skating. And hopefully positive skating. And, and uh, you know, get what we got from the videos that we were growing up, which was just fire. Well, I know if you're stoked on it, I'm going to be stoked on it. That's for sure. You're going to be coming on some of the trips. You need to come down and film with us for a little bit. Yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm down. That'd be really cool. I, I was going to hit up... Uh, jamie or somebody at vans and i yeah. think we could do a little giveaway here um i was sure. wondering if you would want to come up with a concept on how we give away a pair of shoes okay you mean a question or something like that or anything or they contribute a photo or like a question or like anything i don't know top of my head we can give a board away as well if you want sure whatever you want well, we'll insert it right here. We'll think about it and we'll go to, hey guys, we have decided that if you do this and then go to that and add this, you might get that. What's the easiest way of doing it, Greg? How, how do you do it? You can email me at talkingschmidt at gmail.com and you could list Jeff Rowley's first landed trick in the Vans video. Okay. No, he... Here you go. Here's what. What about this one? Okay. First Thrasher cover that I had. What was it and where was it? Email talkingschmidt at gmail.com what Jeff's first Thrasher cover was, and you will be put into a hat that we will pull a winner out, and you'll get... We're going to decide whether you're going to get the whole grand prize or we might have two winners where one gets a board and one gets shoes. We'll figure it out, but this is all on the fly, and... Uh, you might want to fucking submit your answers ASAP because we'll announce it the week after. So, yeah, there's our first giveaway ever. My first giveaway. We, we, we don't know what shoes you're going to get, but, man, they're going to be tight. Yeah, and no, board, you can, board, you can pick them. them. You're going to get this board, right? Oh, I'm gonna sick. Leave it here, post it note. It's going to say Greg on it right here, and when he sends me the winner's address, we'll, we'll ship it to them. Uh-huh. Right? And is it pronounced freedom or free dome? Freedom. Freedom. Okay. Yeah, freedom. Hell yes. All right, man. I think we really covered so much ground and we could talk for like six more weeks and still have six more weeks to talk because fuck, dude. Skateboarding's uh, your life and we miles. obviously, you know, goddamn. Hey, I love you, Jeff. I appreciate that you took the time out, man. This means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. Um, the last thing we do is we fucking throw the needle on the record and we'd get out of here. You got a good song for us? I, I do. I thought of it right as I was coming in, in uh, this morning. Dag Nasty. Okay. Million Days. You know that okay. one? It's energy. So think of skating when you listen to it and it moves. Dag Nasty, Million Days. Hell yes. All right, Jeff. Have a good one. Um, hopefully our paths cross sooner than later. I... I don't know when my next trip is going to be with all this. We're, we're kind of taking it serious. But as soon as I get the green light, I'm going south. So I'll see you soon. Yeah, see you soon. Hey, thanks. You have a wonderful day, man. Thank nice you, to man. You. And take care. Much love. Yeah. Okay, Enjoy cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at talkingschmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary